Then we are flashed back to Jin, who is woken up to find a cat sitting on top of him. Jin shooed the cat away from him, then he threw it away. It turned out that Jin was already in his room. He passed out right after the fight with Viskel. Jilly came into the room and said that the master was finally awake. Jin asked how long he had slept. Jilly said that he had slept for two days. Jin was surprised to hear this. Jin sighed heavily as the banquet was already over and he didn't have time to greet the guests who had arrived to meet him. Jilly said that for the last two days, everyone had been discussing Jin's fight with Viskal. The fact that Jin was able to cut him at the end of a duel with an 8th ranked knight is truly impressive. Jin himself was thinking that even though his heart sword technique wasn't perfect, he got what he wanted and the days of Luna guiding him were starting to pay off. At first, Jin didn't understand the training at all, but it really helped him. However, Jin's heart sword is still at the level where it can only be activated in an emergency. Jin knew he needed to be patient, but it was amazing that he was able to stand up to the 8 ranked knight, however clumsily. In addition, he received enough knowledge, Veridin status. He had also made a sort of friendship with the Ice Palace heiress, and found out that Bubari Gaston and Viscal Ivliano know each other. Jin thought that there were many ways to commit a crime through transformation, but it wasn't urgent, so he decided to dig up more information first. Jilly came into the room and put down the flowers, saying that the heiress of the Ice Palace had left them. Murakan asked if Cirrus liked Jin, but in the language of the Ice Palace, these flowers mean never-ending duel. Jin said it looked like she wanted to fight him again. Murakan asked about how it wasn't the first time Jin had received flowers from a girl. Challenging as it was, it was still a memorable moment. And then Jilly remembered something. She told Jin that the head told him to see him as soon as he recovered. She said it was time to prove his worth. Jin guessed that he would probably live away from his family for a while. Then we see Jin walking down the dark corridor. And so he came to Chiron, who was standing with his back to Jin. Then Chiron turned around. Chiron said it had been a long time since his children had come to see him in such comfortable clothes. Chiron asked Jin if he was aware that he was being sent away. Jin replied that he knew and planned to leave today. Jin could tell from the look in his father's eyes that he was satisfied, and after being reborn, Jin was able to read his father easily, even though he didn't know why. Chiron asked if Jin knew this place. Jin replied that it was a mausoleum, a place where only those who had done great deeds in the name of the family were allowed to enter through the Garden of Swords, a place where great heroes are buried. Chiron said that in other words, this is the land of those who have protected the family for thousands of years. Chiron started talking about the first head teamer run candle, and then immediately said that he wasn't there. Jin replied that he knew about it, and that his grave wasn't in the Garden of Swords either. Suddenly, Chiron started talking about Jin's dark power. Chiron said that the reason why they can't pay respect to the first patriarch, after his death, they made a humiliating pact with the Zipples. They can no longer use magic or honor their ancestors who did. The Zippel lords joined forces and cursed their bloodline. Because of this, all run candles born after the first patriarch were born with a body unable to withstand magic. Chiron asked Jin if he remembered when Jin defeated his Tona brothers with his aura. Chiron didn't ask how Jin gained this power. Jin said that he remembers because he even lied and said that he would use it for the benefit of the family. Chiron said that it was lucky that Jin was a little boy back then, but if it was now, Chiron wouldn't let it go. He then asked Jin if he had heard Soldaret's voice, to which Jin replied that he had heard Soldaret refer to him as a contractor. Chiron said it wasn't fair to Jin's siblings. Chiron then asked Jin about whether Jin would be able to use this power to surpass them and take over the family's care. Jin replied that he would go away and see the world. However, he finds nothing more valuable than the Runkendall family. Then he would use his powers for the sake of the family. Chiron smiled and said that others left the Garden of Swords for the sake of other people's recognition, but Jin left to see if the family was worthy of Jin's recognition. Chiron didn't even know if he should say that he was proud of him or that he was arrogant. Chiron said that Jin had five years. During this time, he must obtain recognition or recognize the family and return with an answer. Jin drew his sword from its scabbard, and then he held the sword out in front of him, pointing it up. Jin said that he would welcome his father again in five years. Here we see how Jin came out of the castle, and Jilly asks him if the conversation with the head went well. Jin said that everything went well, but suddenly he saw something. He looked at Jilly, who was standing with her suitcase and Murakan on her shoulder, and called out to her questioningly. We see something on Jilly's arm sparkling. It was sticking out of the brush, and it was the object of Jin's attention. Jilly said that they say it blocks the aura usage. At least she heard from the elders. She said that it was a little awkward, since she couldn't use her powers. Jilly said that when you're a babysitter, 
You don't earn your own reputation, but it's based on your master's achievements, and as such, my powers are not to be used to help you. And she asked Jin not to make such a face, because it's for him. Jin then said that he would continue to defend Gilly and apologize to her. Gilly said it was enough that she could become Jin's backup and regain her powers when he completed his test. Then Jin turned around. He looked at the gate of the castle that stood behind him. The sun was shining on his thoughtful face, and Jin thought it was funny that he wouldn't be here for five years. After all, it looks like this is the beginning, and so they set out on a sunny day like this. Jin was only intrigued to see the world. Then we are transported back to Chiron, who stood in the mausoleum. He thought that he had only reached the level of Demolord with his sword, but he couldn't break the oath that his ancestors had sworn to the Zippel family. Still a contract with Soldered and Shadow Energy, it is very likely that Junior is the last hope of the Run Candle. Chiron thought that Jin might have enough power to free the Run Candle family. Chiron was looking forward to seeing what Jin's future held. So we see Jilly and Jin walking through the woods, and Jilly asks Jin if it's okay for them to leave without saying goodbye. She said that the cadets under Jin and young lady Luna would be disappointed. Jin said not to worry. After all, Luna is quite free-spirited. As for the cadets, Jin isn't going to die. If Jin had warned them, they would probably have had a send-off with their swords raised. Jin was sure of that, and the thought made him uncomfortable. Jilly asked where Jin was going because from what she'd heard, most of the bannermen went to Mammoth first. Because destroying evil is the most effective way to earn fame. Reserve bannermen of Runkendel before becoming full-fledged bannermen must travel to the outside world and build up their reputation from scratch. In addition, one of the mandatory conditions is independence, which means no family support. For example, Sister Mary defeated all the strongest people in the southern regions of the continent and became known as the Fury of the Southern Lands Berserker Wind, even before being known as a standard bearer. Jin thought about it. The other siblings were away for six months to two years, but his father gave Jin all five. Jin understood that there was only one reason for this decision. Jin had to learn everything about shadow energy. Jin said that they would go to the Arkan Kingdom. Jilly asked if Jin was referring to a nation affiliated with the Lutheran Mage Federation. Then she asked wordly what Jin wanted in Zippel territory. Jin said that when he was on a mission in the ruins of Kalan, he heard that a large number of unregistered mages were rampant in the area. They seemed to be teaming up with martial artists and causing a lot of trouble for the locals of Arkin. Jilly suddenly exclaimed that this was a great idea. She told Jin that she enjoyed getting rid of bad guys when she was on duty. Jin had never actually heard of it and had taken all the information from his previous life. Every unregistered mage and warrior in these lands is a puppet of the Dark Tessing family. What Jin really needs is underground auctions run by entertaining guys. There will be a lot of items whose true value is unknown to anyone, of which Jin has a couple of grimoires and a ring in mind. Jilly took her money bag and said that she didn't think they would be able to use the teleportation gate to reach the Arkan Kingdom. Following the family's rules, she is only able to take 10 gold pieces with her, and Jin, as a reserve standard bearer, is forbidden to reveal his Runkendel identity, so the choice of transport is limited. Said that he would settle everything when they got to Jin Kingdom. Jilly was surprised and asked how they would get there. Jin said that they would just fly and Murakan became interested when he heard this. He asked what Murakan was waiting for and told him to transform. Jilly was worried that someone might recognize Murakan, but Jin said it was fine and they should try it at least once. Murakan can jump down from Jilly's shoulder to the ground and then we see shadow energy start to appear around us. And now we see Murakan and transformed as a dragon. Murakan told them to hold on tight because they would have to fly at full speed to get there by tomorrow. Then we are transported to the castle and see Luna. Suddenly, she felt something. She looked out the window. There she saw a flying dragon. She couldn't believe it was Jin. She was shocked that he rode a dragon when he became a reserve standard bearer. She said Jin was very special and she noticed that he'd speed off without even saying goodbye to his sister. She wished her cold little brother good luck. And now, we are transported to the kingdom of Jin. We see Murakan in human form, and after the ride, Jilly gets carsick. Murakan started yelling at Jin. He said that Gilly was feeling bad because of Jin. Jin replied that it was Murakan who couldn't drive. We can see that Gilly was even worse, and Murakan was worried about her. He was trying to help her, and Jin was confused as he watched. Jin, seeing the current Murakan, wondered if Murakan in the past had behaved badly just to meet people's expectations of black dragons. Murakan said it couldn't be helped, he would take care of. Jillian, Jin put on the hood and asked them to just stay here and not make any noise. Suddenly, 
we are transported to the center of the Jean Kingdom's capital, the Villa family mansion. Sitting on the bank of the pond was the same person that Jin had saved. Despite the grandeur of the banquet in Jin's honor, he didn't find out about it until after it was over. This guy was thinking that even if it was an errand, Jin had saved his life. He wants to meet Jin again and thank him for saving him, just like he promised to do. And then we see Jin coming out of the bushes. Guy was talking about when he would be able to see Jin again and repay his kindness. Suddenly someone called Sember, who turned around, but Jin immediately put his hand over Sember's mouth. Semre started screaming in fear, and Jin tried to calm him down. Jin introduced himself and said that he was the one who saved Summer from the Kinzello boys. Taking a deep breath, Sember asked about how Jin got here. Jin replied that Sember himself had told him to call if he needed help. Sember said that he couldn't forget Jin's kindness because if it wasn't for Jin, Sember would have been dead by now. But Jin interrupted Sember and asked him to bring some gold and cash. Sember was shocked and confused. Suddenly, we are transported to another place and see the story that standard bearers must hide their identity. These are the rules. They must earn a reputation only by their own efforts without the help of their family. It is expected that the young masters of Runkendel, who learned only to fight, lead a poor lifestyle for the first months until they can save up enough by completing tasks to catch criminals or provide the services of mercenaries. Well, everyone has a hard time being panelists, but Jin is different because apparently Sember still thanked him for his kindness. Jilly said that the food in Jean Kingdom wasn't bad. She had prepared for frequent stops like other standard bearers do, but thanks to Jin, they made it in no time at all. Murakhan mocked Gilly by saying that she was the one who said it was extortion to take money from Sember yesterday. Jin said that by helping with the money, Sember was able to pay back his debt. As can be seen, Sember gave Jin a whole bag of money. Jin then looked at the belly and asked Murakhan if it was a girl or a boy. As they were about to pass through the teleportation gate, Jin asked Murakhan about what he would do if he started to vomit again. Murakhan said he was a predator and it was sacred for him to eat too much, even if he started to throw up. According to Murakhan, only Jin insists on teleporting. Jilly then chimed in, feeling awkward and saying that if she was seasick, she could just put up with it. Jin said Gilly's seasickness wasn't the main problem. They head to the Arkan Kingdom, which is connected to the Lutheran Mage Federation run by the Zipper. The family, currently 80% of the active dragons cooperate with the Zipples, so if they carelessly fly in, it would be equivalent to declaring war. Murakhan exclaimed that more than half of these dragons would shit their pants just hearing his name. Murakhan transformed into a cat and said that the world has become a beautiful place since the villains held their heads high. Jin was angry at Murakhan for turning in the middle of the street. More than a dozen mages in the Zippel family had contracted with dragons. On the one hand, Jin is the only Runkendel who has made a contract with a dragon, and if it weren't for his father, the Zipples would have destroyed them by now, and suddenly wondered how they had managed to gather so many contractors, and even in the same generation. This is hardly a coincidence. And then they came to the gate, and the man at the entrance asked them to show their documents. Jin was so lost in thought that he didn't notice them coming. Jin gave him the documents and introduced himself as Jin Grey, and Gilly was named Gilly Piton. He said that they want to visit the Arcan Kingdom for tourism. Then they're sitting on the couch in the waiting room. It was announced that the move to the Arcan Kingdom was starting possible headaches and dizziness may occur. Passengers were asked to stay in a comfortable position and not get up. Jilly said that is expected from the identification cards made by the family. They passed without problems. Jin said that the cards were certainly sophisticated enough to fool even the Vermont Empire's Special Affairs Department. And now the start of teleportation was announced. Murakhan, as expected, became Isle. Jin thought that the Arkin Kingdom reminded him of something from his previous life. But it's been 15 years, and now we see that the heroes have arrived. They arrived at the Lutero Magic Federation Arkin Kingdom. Jin was thinking about something. He was thinking about the capital. After all, here he spent the last year before rebirth. For 15 years, he was not here, and the landscape is still the same. Street vendors roam, and homeless people lie around people with grim faces. Jilly said that it was a strange dark place despite the fine weather. Jin guessed that it was probably because of the Tessin family. Jin suggested that we settle down first, and then track down the prey. Standing in front of the house, Murakan asked Jin if he was serious about staying in this crepey shed. Gilly said that Jin probably had a plan, but Murakan grumbled that since Jin was rich, there was no point in them staying here. Jin asked if it was a good idea for a bunch of unregistered magicians to come to such an environment and show that they had a lot of money still. Murakan is still angry, in his opinion, 
Not even orcs would come here. So they went into a dark room, and there they saw a sleeping man. Jin asked the man if he was the owner of the inn. The man apparently did not see the guest for so long that at first, he did not believe it. This person assumed that Murakan was a Casanova. Jin is an aspiring swordmaster, and the young lady next to him is a maid. He wickedly smiled. Then, unexpectedly, he pulled out three glasses of drinks. They told them that they were at Jet's Inn and that he had plenty of rooms available. He said there was orange juice in the glasses and let them help themselves and choose any room they liked. The innkeeper wanted the guests to drink the juice, and when they woke up, they would start a new life in the underground auction house. Murakan and I had the drink suspiciously, then noticed something. Murakan can smash the glass and throw it directly at the innkeeper's forehead. The innkeeper was horrified. He didn't understand what Murakan was doing. Then Murakan jumped up on the counter. He kicked the innkeeper right in the head. Murakan asked the innkeeper how dare he try to poison him. Meanwhile, Jin poured out his juice. Thankfully, no one took a sip. The innkeeper pretended not to understand. Murakan was furious. He told him that he was going to die today. The battered hotel owner started asking Murakan to wait and offered to talk, but Murakan was so angry that he didn't listen to him and kicked him in the face again, and so Jin is transported back in time. He remembers that Jet is a self-proclaimed high-class informant, someone to whom Jin was in debt in a previous life. Thanks to his help, Jin, who was exiled from his family and had no foundation, was able to settle down here in Arkin. Over time, they became closer, but this did not lead to anything good. Under the pretext of getting to know the underground auction houses of Tessim, he had cheated Jin countless times and taken everything but his clothes. Just thinking about it pisses Jin off. Jin watched Murakan can beat up Jet. Jin thought about how he would make the most of Jet this time. Murakan continued to beat up Jet, who was curled up on the floor, but Jet suddenly exclaimed that he was going to ask them a question. He said that despite his appearance, he was a rank five. Murakan said that no one cared and hit Jet again. Murakan wasn't going to stop, so Jet started shouting that he was wrong. It wasn't poison. It was a sedative. Jin decided that it was probably enough. Jin ordered Murakan to stop and offered to listen to what Jet had to say. Murakan was angry and couldn't understand why they should listen to someone who tried to poison them. Jet begged Jin for salvation, calling him his lord. Jin sat down across from him and said he would ask a few simple questions. If Jet lies, he would die. If he told the truth, he would live. Jin said that he would judge his answers subjectively, based on his feelings and instincts. Murakan stopped hitting Jet, entrusting Jin with further decisions. Jin asked Jet what he was doing. Jet replied that he was the innkeeper and an informant, but Jin knew, so he pressed Jet. Jet continued his answer. He was an informant to his officer and also a human trafficker. Then he begged Jin for mercy and he promised that he would be useful. Jin said it looked like Jet was trying to drug them so he could sell them somewhere, to which Jet said yes. Jin asked where. Jet tried to act clueless, but Jin immediately pressed his fingers and Jet said over his screams, saying that Tessin was dark organization that operates in an underground auction house that runs auction houses, people trafficking, illicit drugs, stolen treasures, and even artifacts. Jin said that Jet would heal by the evening and asked if he knew what to do next. Jet said, yes, he knew. Murakan asked Jin if he was going to spend money on medical bills for such scum. Jilly supported Murakan, saying that if they spared Jet, he would try to deceive them again, a dark organization and an underground auction house. Murakan and Gilly didn't understand what Jin meant. Jin asked if there was anything better than destroying them, and then said that it was never too late to get rid of Jet if he double-crossed them. Jin said they would trust him because they needed a guide through Arkin anyway. But first, he's going to find someone to take care of him. Murakan frowned. He was not happy with Jin's decision. After leaving the inn, Jin let out a sigh of relief. He didn't expect it to be so tiring to play ignorant when you know everything. But it's not his plan to tell anyone about the rebirth, so it can't be helped. And now the heroes are in the hotel, and it's night outside. The doctor said not to disturb the hand until the bones are mended. When the doctor left, he told them to call at any time if they needed him. Jet was surprised that the man they met on the street turned out to be such a talented doctor. While Jet looked at himself in the mirror, he couldn't understand why these crazy people first beat him up and then cured him. Jet wondered who they were. He assumed that Jin was the heir to a martial arts family or Vermont Special Affairs Department, but whatever it was, he knew that there would be nothing left of him if he decided to stab him in the back. Jin told Jet that it was time to move out, and Jit got scared and acted clueless again. Jin said again that they had to go with a grim face to scare Jet straight, and here we are, transported to an underground auction house. 
The guards standing at the entrance saw Jet and our heroes. They asked him why he brought such a crowd. The guard asked if they were merchandise, but Jet answered telling the guard to stop talking nonsense and open up because they were his guests. And so they went through and then there was a wooden door where the doorman was standing. He opened the door for them and something luxurious was happening behind it. Jin looked at it and saw that huge shiny chandeliers were hanging there. There was also an orchestra led by a conductor, all wearing masks. Murakan said that these guys were funny since they brought a whole orchestra. Jet said it wasn't much for a bandit run hole. Although everyone knows that Tessin's boss is called Salka, the real puppet master is someone else. Jet handed the mask to Murakan and asked him to take it. He said that if they wanted to go to the auction house, it was better to hide their faces. Jin put on a mask and asked who the real boss was. Jet replied that it was someone called Spider Hands. Jet said that everything here was designed to suit his taste because he did his best to hide his lack of education. Jet said that not only does Spider Hands have the ability to pacify these dirty streets, but he is also a 7th ranked martial artist from arable land. Jet said that there were rumors that Spider Hands had connections with the pure blood run candle family across the sea. Murakan said just ignore it and asked Jin if he really thought these guys were hanging out with scumbags from the bottom of this weak state. Gilly supported Murakan and said that she didn't see anyone matching the description. Jin didn't say anything, but he was thinking that there was one. The person who had put a curse on him that made Jin unable to wield a sword if there was a connection to the Federation of Magic. Then it's very likely that it's him. A ninth ranked curse that hinders one's ability to wield a sword blade illusion. Jin denied the possibility that there was a mage in testing of who could cast such a complex spell. But after 10 years in Storm Castle and 5 in the Garden of Swords, Jin had been unable to find a single clue for 15 years. So he decided that he should try to find any clues. Jin said they were here to blow this place up. And a nice bonus would be that they would find out the identity of Spider Hands and his connection to the Run Candles. And here, we see them walking somewhere in the auction house. Murakan and Jilly were not happy with Chin's plan, as they didn't really know anything about it. Gilly said that the guards they saw along the way looked pretty strong. However, Jin said that he had thought everything through and asked not to worry. Jilly asked him what exactly he had planned, so Jin called them over and told them the whole plan. After that, Murakan says that sometimes he doesn't understand at all what's going on in Jin's head or how he came to think of such things in the first place. Gilly said it was definitely unusual. But was Jin sure what would happen? Jin told her not to worry because they could always just run away. So Jet stopped and said it was here. Jet said, welcome, opening the way for them. And here we have a top view of the Tessin Underground auction house. All the heroes sat down on the balcony and the auction began. The person who announced the auction also said that it doesn't matter where you are from or what your story is. Their first lot today is something that guests can use to suit their tastes. And now we see people in shackles coming on stage. The host said they were all in good condition. He encouraged them to take a look at the guy at the very end because it looked like he would be very useful. Jin realized that Jet was going to sell them the same way. Jet put his hands around his neck and said that he's stupid for thinking that. Jin was saddened by the sight, but he was still glad that he didn't see any children among them. Murakan asked Jin what they would do. Jin said to wait. Jin said that he had heard that sometimes some interesting items slipped through at these auctions. Said that if something like this happens, he will buy it first and then make a move. Murakan was concerned about Jin's decision. Jin was thinking about the artifact, but at the same time, he remembered some ring that was rotting somewhere in the vault. Jin can only get it after their plan is implemented. And so the host happily turned to the ladies and gentlemen and said that the auction had begun. Jin planned to wait patiently, and now a week later, we see how the host calls prices and conducts the auction in full. Then we see Jet whispering something to the young master. Jin had spent a whole week just watching. If the master didn't buy something today, the people from Tessin might cause Jin trouble. Jin asked Jet if it was his job to prevent them. Jet pretended to say that the young master could do as he pleased, but Jet was angry. His job and his life were in danger. Jet was thinking that whoever Jin was, they were going to throw him out at this rate. Jet just wanted Jin to buy something and not involve him in his mess. Meanwhile, the host announced the next lot, the first grimoire of the evening. The host said that this grimoire belonged to Matthew and Nick, a magician who once ruled the world, and they couldn't neutralize it, but powerful magic must be etched in the pages. Jin watched it as if it was fun, because this was a fake and they were crooks themselves. Most of Matthew's grimoires are controlled by the Zippel family, which means that the chance of devilality of this testing is zero. 
Jin thought about how he had been at the Tessin auction for a whole week, and every day was the same. The host continues to talk nonsense, and magicians are willingly fooled. The host announces another Tessin made by Zenmi and sets the initial bid at 50 gold. Jin thought about how they sometimes put up such grimoires, obscure ones like lottery tickets. Murakan then put his hand on Jin's shoulder and told him to buy this because the grimoire, if it really belonged to the Zenmi, needed it. The host looked at the balcony in surprise. Everyone was surprised that Jin had placed 150 gold coins. Jin looked at Murakan, thinking that since the grimoire had been recommended by a dragon, there was no reason to ask questions. The host announced the next grimoire. This is the heister's grimoire, and Jin recognized the name and was surprised. Of course, no one had ever heard of Hister. The host looked again in surprise at the balcony, where Jin raised his hand. Jin placed 200, and everyone in the audience was shocked. Everyone was discussing who this person was, who kept buying up strange things. Murakan asked Jin why he bought the book and if he knew who it belonged to. Jin said that he just thought it would be a good idea to buy something else, but it's actually his master's item from a previous life. The Hister family was destroyed hundreds of years ago, and Jin found their trail here, and so the host announced that the grimoire was sold for 200 gold. Jin thought about what he would give to his master when he met her, and then said that it was enough and time to make a move. After leaving the auction, Murakan flipped through the grimoires. It turned out to be the real thing, then asked what kind of grimoire histers was. It was bizarre and written in a strange code. Jin was happy about that because only the master and he could read this code. Jet said that it was good that Jin bought something, because otherwise they would be in trouble. Jin to Jet, who was smiling happily. Jin said that he needed to meet with spider hands. Jet immediately changed his face. Jet said it was impossible, but Jin just put his hand on Jet's shoulder and told him to go and tell Spider Hands that Verid and Zipple wanted to see him. Jet was shocked to hear this. He ran to Alutch's office and told him that this madman wasn't from Vermont's special affairs department, but a full-blooded Zipple. Jet was incredibly happy. Thinking about becoming an informant for the Zipple and leaving this hole, Jet opened the door and shouted for Ola to come out. Verid and Zipple is here. There was a crowd of security guards in suits standing there. So the guard came out to Jin and called out to him disrespectfully. We see that behind this guard was a beaten jet and other guards. The guard started to say something, but Jin hit him right in the jaw. Jin then used fire magic and asked if they were joking with him. He asked the guard if he was Spider Hands while holding a fireball. The guard was horrified and said that Spider Hands had ordered him to escort them. Jin said that he revealed his name, but Spider Hands dared to send his pawns. Jin told the guard to tell Spider Hands to come here himself, to crawl on all fours right at Jin's feet, and then we see that the man in the red suit and all the guards were lying on the floor, bowing down to Jin. The man said he was Spider Hands, the one who took care of Tessin. He said that he made a mistake by not acknowledging him, and then begged for forgiveness. Jet stood behind Jin and thought that if someone else claimed to be Veridin and Zipple, he would laugh in his face. But Jin was different. His aura was different. Jet smiled ominously as he thought about the fact that Jin had used a fireball before, and that was at least rank 5 mana. It would be difficult for others to use it freely at that age, but not for a Zipple. Then we fast forward to events a week ago. Jin said that he would pretend to be Veridin and Murakan, and Gilly were surprised to hear this. Jin said that even if the Spider Hands knew someone who knew the Zipple, it was unlikely that this person was above the status of an old servant. In other words, Spider Hands can't prove that Jin is not Veradin. Gilly was worried because it wasn't a matter of Jin being found out or not. If the family or the patriarch got wind of it in the future, then Jin would be in trouble. Jin orders Spider Hands to get up. Spider Hands immediately stood up. He called him Sir. Jin then showed two grimoires and asked Spider Hands if he knew what they were. Spider Hands replied that they were magical manuscripts and apologized for selling ancient magical manuscripts without Zipple's permission. These manuscripts were highly valued by the Zipple family. He asked Spider Hands how much money he had earned that way. Spider Hands said it was a pathetic excuse, but he was a martial artist. He was enough not to be able to determine the value of these items and inconvenience of Aradin. He promised to do everything possible to get them back and ask for a chance. Jin said it was easier for him to get them back himself than to rely on a guy like Spider Hands. Jin then ordered Spider Hands to bring the list of auctioneers in the account book. He then said that the Zipple family would launch an investigation tomorrow, which left Spider Hands confused. He was terrified and lowered his head. This is the end because no matter how hard the Tessings try, Unlike the Zipples, they are just a small local gang. If anything comes up during the investigation that the mages don't like, Tessin is finished.
and so Spider Hands gives them everything that was at the auction. Jin asked if there were any others to which Spider Hands said yes, but they were in a heavily guarded vault. Spider Hands said that it was located in the workers' residence, and if Jin would allow him to leave temporarily, he would deliver them immediately. It would take a couple of hours. So, Jin stopped him and asked what the heck Spider Hands trying to do. He asked if Spider Hands was going to run away and destroy important documents, then check if Jin was real by asking the guys who were bribed by Spider Hands. Spider Hands only lowered his head in annoyance. Jin said that Spider Hands could do whatever he wanted, but he had to remember that he was still on Jin's hook. Then Spider Hands turned around saying that he would be back soon and ordered the servants to show Viridian the vault in his absence. While Spider Hands was leaving, he ordered one of the guards to keep Jin in the mansion until he returned. Spider Hands was furious. He thought about how Jin was arrogant and thought that everyone obeyed him. He was angry that he had spent so much money on the Zipples, but he decided that he would find a way to buy them back. We see Murakan throwing boxes around and telling Jilly to take everything. She asked if he was sure this was fine, to which Murakan replied that it is stolen goods after all. Murakan didn't find anything useful, only garbage. While throwing objects, Murakan hit the guard. Murakan whispered to Jin about Spider Hands that he would find out that Jin was lying when he got back. So what would he do? Jin said they were just buying stuff here at a 100% discount and then ran away before he got back. Then he saw a box and he opened it. There was a ring lying there. Jin finally found the ring he was looking for. Gilly asked Jin how could he act so calmly when stealing like this. Jin said he'd take it as a compliment. And Jet suddenly burst into the room with a stack of papers in his hands. It turned out to be the same papers that Jin had requested. Jet said he had recorded all the birth regions and ages of the slaves sold here. Jin headed for the exit, saying that they were done there, but he was stopped by a security guard and told that the boss would bring the account book soon. Until then, he asked them to stay in the mansion, but Jin immediately punched the guard in the jaw. With this blow, he knocked out his tooth and then the guard fell unconscious. Jet had said that Jin was great and not only a powerful mage, but also a great fighter. But he was thinking about why Jin had bunched Spider Hand's subordinate. Jin asked Jet if he had a family. He replied that he had a son. Jin then told Jet to grab him and run. Better go to the Vermont Empire. Hearing this, Jet was surprised. To gives them the papers and introduces himself as an informant, because this is the only way he can survive. Jet started to get stubborn about staying with Jin until the end, because he had worked so hard for this opportunity. Jet asked to be allowed to serve Jin in great deeds for the rest of his life. Jet wanted to succeed at something for once. Then Jin said he wasn't Verid and Zippel. Jet was both shocked and heartbroken. And now two hours had passed. We see Spider Hands standing in that room, and the security guard that Jin knocked out Spider Hands said that he had heard that Verid and Zippel had long silver hair. Spider Hands subordinate then said that they took information about the slaves and their clients and then ran away, saying that Tessian was finished. Spider Hands was so angry that even the veins in his neck bulged and he ordered them to catch them. The subordinate hesitated. Then enraged, he grabbed him by the head and then with incredible force swung him against the wall. The throw was so strong that the subordinate almost broke through the wall. The other subordinates felt fear. Spider Hands started shouting to his subordinates to take all those who were left and bring back these crooks. He shouted at the top of his lungs that he would skin them with his own hands. Meanwhile, Murakan sits near the fire with the others and inquires if there's a reason Jin has been lingering around. Jin responds that he doesn't believe there's anything to be gained from worrying about Spider Hands. Rather, they need to ascertain if he's connected to the Run Candles. Murakan acknowledges this, suggesting they consider it as their final farewell before departing. He notes that Spider Hands gave them a grimoire and even gifted him a masterpiece, which caused Spider Hands to panic upon seeing it at the auction. Murakan wonders how Spider Hands could have known about such an ancient item and managed to obtain it. Suddenly, some guards spot them, and one guard alerts the others, exclaiming over here. They're hiding over here. He then calls for the boss. Murakan grumbles about their noise and Jin suggests they go have a brief conversation. Spider Hands notices them and declares he found him, the scamming idiots. He demands to know how Jin dares to think he could fool Spider Hands and escape. Spider Hands declares that he's going to hang him in the market as an example and demonstrate what happens to anyone who crosses the head of Tessin. Jin counters by listing the evidence he's uncovered, the registry of kidnapped slaves from Mement, 
the transaction ledger detailing the ancient grimoire sought by the Zippel family, and the customer registry naming all the aristocrats who turned a blind eye to Spider Hands' operations. He throws the papers into the air, saying he's already spread this information far and wide, and by tomorrow, the entire world will know about Spider Hands' crimes. Spider Hands hurls insults at him, threatening to ensure that his death won't be easy. He vows to skin him alive, and every time Jin passes out from the pain, Spider Hands plans to revive him with flames. Jin calls out to Murican, who responds reluctantly. Jin informs him that he wants a one-on-one -on -one fight with Spider Hands. Murican sighs, saying what a pain. Spider Hands, outraged, calls Jin a crazy idiot and demands to know what he thinks he can accomplish alone. He orders his subordinates not to just stand there and watch, but to attack. Spider Hands' men launch their attack with magic crystals. Spider Hands instructs them to leave the kid alive, but to kill the rest of the group. They move to strike at Murican, but he quickly counters, taking them down one by one. As he advances, he leaps high into the air, striking another guard with such force that the others are left in shock. Spider Hands shouts at his men, asking why they are just standing around. A gray-haired guard explains that firing magic at this point could hit their own comrades. Spider Hands responds by telling him to aim at the people in the back. Jin advises Jilly to step back for a moment. The guards use fire and water magic spells to attack, but Jin creates a protective shield to defend himself and Jilly. The guards are shocked by this. Jin remarks that things have become a bit easier thanks to his sister Luna. Jilly comments that despite everything, he didn't even say goodbye to her before leaving. Murakan observes that their adversaries rely on numbers because they're weak and grumbling. What a pain. Just drop dead all at once. Then he launches an attack using light magic, leaving everyone stunned by its intensity. Spider hands his subordinates kill them all. A guard remarks that the boss has gone mad. Jin says that this actually saves them some time. Spider hands, furious and cursing, demand to know who sent them and why. Jin dismisses the question, retorting that it doesn't matter if he tells him or not because he's going to die anyway. As Spider hands attacks, Jin sidesteps, realizing how fast Spider hands is. Spider hands says he can't afford to be taken down without a fight. Murakin acknowledges that he's found a worthy opponent, suspecting the rumors about Spider Hands being a seven star martial artist might be true. He comments that Spider Hands seems different from Vishkal, his previous opponent, and this one seems eager to kill him. Murakan tells Jin to give it his best shot and not to die. Spider Hands expresses his disdain, remarking on his arrogance and questioning how a mere mage dares to step onto the front line. Jin retorts, asking if Spider Hands, a rookie, is looking down on him and then moves to attack with his sword. Spider Hands inquires about the sword and manages to block Jin's attack. He counterattacks, noting that Jin isn't a mage after all. Jin steps back and attempts another attack. Spider Hands swiftly moves, attempting to strike from behind, but he evades just in time. Spider Hands' attack lands, and he taunts Jin, calling it a shallow hit. Jin realizes that Spider Hands is fast and that he hasn't been fighting at full strength. But even so, it's already too much for him to handle. Spider Hands comments that the fireball Jin used at the auction house must have been an artifact. He realizes that he's in this predicament because he fell for a simple trick. The real problem, however, is the guy who single-handedly took down all of his subordinates. Spider Hands is certain that he's even stronger than he is. He wonders why Murakan is just standing there. Murakan observes that Jin seems to be taking some hard blows, remarking, that little idiot. Jilly, concerned, asks if Murakan plans to intervene pointing out that while it's the young master's wish to take on a seven-star martial artist, it might be a bit early for him to do so. Murakan dismisses her concern, saying it's fine and that the idiot needs to learn how precious life is. Jilly agrees, acknowledging the truth in his words. He then remarks that it seems she believes the kid is going to lose. On the other side, Spider Hands lunges to attack while Jin attempts to block him. Everyone is taken aback by the ferocity of Spider Hands' assault. Spider Hands charges again, declaring that this will be the end for Jin. However, Jin smirks, using his magical fire spell, and says that in the past, when Runcandle's magic swordsmen fought, even a two-star difference was insignificant to them. He launches a burst of fire at Spider Hands, knocking him back. Spider Hands, bewildered, question whether it wasn't an artifact, realizing that Jin is a magic swordsman. Jin's sword lights up with magical energy as he summons lightning to attack. Spider Hands blocks the attack. He mocks Jin, saying that standing so exposed will lead to his demise. Jin moves forward, in his hand a magical ring, and commands his helmet to release. Spider Hands is shocked, 
asking what is happening. Jin then takes his sword and delivers a deep cut to Spider-Hands. As he does, a dark, magical aura envelops him. He sheathes his sword. Murakan is surprised by what he sees, commenting that it must be Muelta's rune. Gilly asks him to explain what Muelta's rune is. Murakan recounts that thousands of years ago, Muelta was created for Bement, the first emperor, who was a lover of a demon. During that time, there was a war, and Muelta was a masterpiece that could block all attacks below seven-star power. Murakan expresses his curiosity about how such an artifact ended up in the hands of a gang. Jin reflects on Muelta's rune, noting that it's an artifact meant to be given to the Bement Emperor in five to six years. He recalls that during that period, the Academy and the press were in chaos because of this helmet, and he remembers precisely when, where, and on which date it was first discovered. Jin delivers a severe blow to Spider-Hands and tells him that he wants to ask him one thing before he dies. He mentions that he has heard about Spider-Hands' connections to the Runcandle family and asks if it's true. Murakan responds that he should have asked earlier, questioning what answer he expects to receive from someone on their deathbed. Spider-Hands acknowledges this and confirms that he now knows Jin's true identity. He admits that it was indeed true that he failed, but he clarifies that Jin is just the youngest member of the family. Spider-Hands adds that he can't stop the other person. Murakan asks what he means by the other person. Jin elaborates, mentioning Spider-Hands and speculating that it's probably not his real name. He explains that they need to investigate further, because having a seven-star martial artist as the boss of a gang and having connections to the Runcandle family seems suspicious. Murakan remarks that it's not entirely unusual, noting that one of Jin's ancestors, a nine-star, was a bartender. However, he insists that they need to identify the person Spider-Hands referred to, especially since he is going to lead the family. He realizes that he has failed, and he can't stop that person. If Spider-Hands had acknowledged his identity, then what was meant by failure would have likely been tied to the bladed illusion. The mention of him being the youngest and unable to stop that person indicates knowledge of the power struggle among his siblings. He considers the possible suspects, dismissing older sister because she left the family. Mew, Anne, and the twins are ruled out due to their youth and lack of experience. The others aren't clever or ambitious enough to engage in such underhanded schemes. He then narrows down the likely candidate, someone who is acutely aware of rank and who began manipulating events as soon as they recognized his talent. Joshua Run Candle is the next heir. Jin concludes that no one else holds as much influence as Joshua, whether he's jumping to conclusions or not. He intends to uncover the truth soon. The scene shifts to the next morning. A little boy with black hair stands on the street, holding some newspapers and shouts that Tessing has been eliminated after a joint investigation between the Zippel family and Beement. The evil gang that terrorized the innocent was taken down in just one day. Jin reads the headline and remarks that it seems like Jet did a good job. He observes that while Jet might have faced harassment from the Zippel family in Beement, it's a small price to pay compared to saving his own life. Murakin comments that the criminals deserved even more suffering but he's glad the Zippel family and Bement are taking the credit. It means Jin will get the benefits. Jin agrees, listing the gains, a valuable ring, skilled grimoires, a seven-star knight defeat, and even a victory in a real battle. Just then, Gilly arrives, addressing Jin as Jung's master. She reminds him that being a seven-star knight doesn't automatically guarantee competence, and he shouldn't become careless just because he defeated Spider-Hands. She suggests it would be wise to be more cautious in the future. Jin agrees, acknowledging that they have nothing on someone like Jilly, who is the real deal. He assures her he will be more careful from now on. Jin expresses gratitude to Jet, noting that thanks to him, no one will suspect their whereabouts. He suggests they relax and head to their next destination. Murakan inquires about their next destination, to which Jin responds that Tekin is an independent city. Gilly remarks that Tekin is known for its seven colors. Murakin asks about the significance of the seven colors. Jin hands some coins to an old man nearby. Gilly explains that Tekin houses a large information center, which alongside the Run Candle, Zippel, and Beement organizations, is one of the most reliable sources of information. Murakin then realizes that Jin intends to gather information on potential adversaries, similar to how he utilized Jet, and asks if that sounds like a plan. Jin acknowledges it as one possibility. After a while, a person announces that they are all aboard and they embark on a boat. Jin reflects that moving forward, he needs to prioritize his memories from before his regression while with Gilly and Murakan, ensuring they serve a proper purpose. Additionally, he considers the matters related to Viscal Ivliano, 
Bouberie, Kinzello, and Spider Hand's past connections to Run Candle. He realizes there are many things, such as the Kalan ruins and taboo magic, that he needs to investigate further. For this purpose, he determines that the seven colors in Takan are the most suitable place. After a while, Murakan mentions that he has discovered what the grimoire left behind by Zenmi actually is. He believes it's light magic. Jin is surprised, saying he thought that form of magic disappeared during ancient times. Murakan confirms that it did, explaining that Zenmi was an enemy of the Zippel family back then, and the Zippels erased any traces of their adversaries from history. That's the Zippel family's typical approach. They eliminate those who become a nuisance to them. Murakan adds that this is why there are no existing records, and if he can't transcend his current limitations, the Run Candle family could face a similar fate in the future. Learning about light magic could be crucial. He's going to demonstrate something, emphasizing how quickly he can adapt. He suggests he look forward to it, as this might be the type of magic he needs most at this moment, and then reveals a glowing magical energy in his hand. Murakan urges Jin to open his eyes wide and observe, remarking that it's light magic, but asking why it's black. He increases his power, laughing, then asks how it felt, seeing it for just a moment, but already experiencing a sensation like his eyes are swelling. Jin covers his face with his hand and comments that this magic can definitely be used for both offense and defense. He notes that it's called Flashbang, one of Zenmi's most prized spells, and he's thrilled to have obtained it. Murakan mentions a certain Hister mage. Jin interrupts, questioning why he is bringing up this mage all of a sudden. Murakan pulls out a book, explaining that it's encoded in a way that even frustrates him, and he's unsure of its contents. He wonders if it will be useful. Jin suggests leaving it aside for now. He agrees, stating that one day he'll find a skilled decipherer to tackle it. The scene shifts to a week later in Tekken, the independent city. Jilly is delighted as she explores the city, remarking how pretty it is. Jin reflects on the unique characteristics of this location, a city on a small island in the southern part of the central continent, unaffiliated with either the Run Candle family or the Zippel family. Although the population is relatively low, it's a popular tourist spot with ocean views visible from almost any point in the city. Jilly comments that the entire city seems vibrant and asks if they should find a place to stay while Murakan jumps off her shoulder. Jin agrees, suggesting they head toward the city's center to look for accommodation. Murakan transforms into his human form and complains that he won't choose another lousy place this time. Jin scolds him, saying that he's told him repeatedly not to transform in the middle of the city. Murakan retorts that humans don't really pay much attention. However, a little girl notices him transforming and points excitedly, exclaiming that a cat has just turned into a person. She then shouts to others, announcing that a black cat turned into a black-haired man, asking how he did it. The group is taken aback by her reaction. She then yells for him to teach her how to do it. After a while, Jin tells Julia that she saw it wrong, asking how a cat could turn into a human. Julia, eating ice cream, insists it's not her, but her friend Yuri who saw it, and she's sure a black cat turned into that man. She asks why the mister lying. He responds that he's not lying and that he's not a mister. Julia argues that he is lying and that he is, in fact, a mister Jin, trying to defuse the situation, reminds her that he bought her ice cream and asks if she could pretend she saw nothing. She refuses, saying she won't lie. Jilly, standing with Murakan, asks what they should do. She mentions that they thought Julia was lost, so they decided to take her to the garrison. But if rumors spread there, they might attract the Zippel family's attention. Murakan dismisses the worry, saying nobody will believe what a child says. Jilly retorts that if Murakan had listened to the young master, none of this would have happened in the first place. After a while, Julia points to a building and says it's the information center, mentioning that she doesn't like the garrison. Jilly inquires about what's wrong. Julia explains that she doesn't like it because they always harass her and bother her. Jilly expresses concern, suggesting that maybe it's a place that uses violence and exploits the common folk. Jin considers that the child could be a criminal for all they know and suggests they go inside and check first. A guard notices Julia and asks if she is in Julia, then instructs someone to bring the leader as little Miss Julia is here. Jin politely asks if the guard knows the child. The guard chuckles and confirms he knows her all too well, as she's their leader's daughter. Jin asks about the leader's daughter, and Julia spots Fid. Jin reflects on the leader of the center, wondering if that's really the only role she plays, 
Meanwhile, Julia runs toward Fid and hugs Fid. Fid gently reprimands her, reminding her not to wander too far. Julia responds by saying that Fid doesn't play with her enough. Fid apologizes, promising to play with her a lot after he finishes his work. Julia asks if he really meant it, pointing out that Fid had been busy before and hadn't kept his promise. Fid assures her he will, emphasizing that she can't just leave because of his work. Fid then notices Jin and his companions, commenting that most people in the city know Julia, suggesting that Jin should be more cautious. He apologizes for his delayed introduction, extending his hand and introducing himself as the leader of Tekin's garrison. Jin shakes his hand, introducing himself as Jin Gray, and explaining that he's just visiting Takan as a tourist. He remarks that if he's a tourist, he should give him something in return, and asks if there's anything he might need. He asks if he can recommend a place to stay. Julia whispers something in his ear, and Fid pulls out a pen, calling for some paper. A guard quickly brings some paper, and he writes something down before handing it to Jin. Fid explains that it's a letter of recommendation, with the garrison leader's seal, ensuring that wherever he goes if he shows this, he will be treated well. He thanks him once again for finding Julia. Jin responds that they should be the ones thanking Fit, and then says they'll be on their way. As they turn to leave, Fit asks Julia if a cat really turned into a human. Julia confirms it, but adds that the others don't want to talk about it, so she pretends not to know. Fid praises her, saying she did a good job, and remarks that everyone has secrets. He reflects on the transformation, noting that it's something only a dragon can do. Meanwhile, Jilly sits on the bed and remarks that the service is excellent, noting that he's only experienced this kind of treatment when he was at Hufester. Murakan, lying on his bed, comments on how soft it is, adding that this, this is what a proper lodge should feel like. Jilly acknowledges the benefit of the letter of recommendation, saying that things are going smoothly in Tikan, and remarks that they've had great luck since they arrived. She then mentioned that she'd been thinking about the ice cream Julia had eaten earlier, asking if she could have some as well, since it's a popular treat in Takan. Jin wonders why she's asking him for permission, telling her to go ahead and order it. She leaves the room, responding that she'll be back soon. Murakan comments that it's been a while since they lived in such comfort, remarking that it feels like they're on vacation. He then asks Jin how he plans to meet the Seven Colors. Murakan points out that the Seven Colors won't be easy to meet. Jin responds that he has a plan, explaining that the Seven Colors is the most reputable information center in Takan, and at its core is a figure known as the Noble Sword, Kashmir. He reflects that Kashmir is a renowned swordsman, widely known and respected, who was even recommended to teach beginner swordsmanship to the Runcandle family. However, that's the extent of what most people know about him. Jin recalls that in 10 years, Kashmir will reveal himself as the Emperor of Beement and will leverage the information gathered by the Seven Colors. He thinks that Kashmir will acquire ruling power from Bemen, the Zippel family, and the Run Candle family, gaining the support needed to establish Tekin as an independent kingdom with him as its first king. He considers Kashmir to be a meticulous person, not just skilled in swordsmanship, but also adept at concealing himself for an extended period. He speculates that he might become someone who can support him. However, the challenge lies in how he will approach him. Just then, Gilly enters the room and alerts Jin and Merican that something is amiss. She explains that there's no one in the lodge. All the employees and guests have disappeared, and she senses that something is off. Kashmir Alfren places a hand on her shoulder, inquiring about their well-being and asking if it would be acceptable for him to intrude for a moment. Jin observes him and wonders why Kashmir Alfran is here. Murakan, angered, moves to attack him. Jin intervenes, urging him to stop and not kill him. Murakan transforms into a shadow dragon, then sarcastically repeats Kashmir's greeting, asking if he is well before pointing out that no, Kashmir's well-being will cease to exist. Jin wonders why the noble sword Kashmir is here all of a sudden. Kashmir shouldn't have any business in Arkan, especially since they just arrived in Tikan and haven't caused any trouble. Jin then realizes that Kashmir isn't alone. Three or four, more guards are with him. He thinks that at this rate, they might get overwhelmed and tell Murakan to calm down, as the space is too small and fighting here could injure Jilly. Murakan transforms back into his human form and questions Kashmir if he even knows who he is. Kashmir asks what he's talking about. Murakan reiterates the question, asking if he knows who he is, then mutters that he is an idiot while embracing Jilly. He also expresses his frustration, asking why his language is so informal and if he disrespects everyone just because he has a sword at his waist and drags around his underlings. Jin reflects that for once, Murakan restrained himself. Kashmir clarifies, saying that's not what he meant. Murakan responds angrily, asking what he did mean, 
and accuses Kashmir of barging and uninvited, demanding answers. He repeats his question, asking if he knows who he is. Kashmir admits he doesn't know. Murakan then retorts, wondering why he speaks so informally, as if he's above everyone else, just because he has a sword and a group of followers. Jin intervenes, telling Murakan to stop, saying that's enough. He asks Murakan to calm down and put away his sword, then politely addresses him, asking if he's Sir Noble Sword Kashmir. Jin adds that he's heard a lot about his reputation and knows him well. Kashmir seems puzzled and asks how Jin knows his name and who he is. Jin formally introduces himself, revealing his real name. Murakan and Jilly are taken aback by this sudden disclosure. Jin suggests that they continue their conversation in a different location, offering to answer any of his questions. After a while, Kashmir sits in front of Jin, with Gilly and Murakan standing behind Jin. Jin thanks Kashmir for dismissing his soldiers, remarking that it suggests a level of trust. Kashmir contemplates that he brought the soldiers after receiving a report about a dragon sighting, but that it turned out to be a misjudgment on his part for thinking that they could capture a dragon. Instead, it was Murakan who was visibly furious, and he was sure that the intense pressure felt was not from any ordinary human, but from the dragon himself. He realizes that if he hadn't intervened, everyone in the room might have died. He also recognizes Jilly McLaurin, thinking he met her before his fall from grace in the Bement Palace. He recalls her military prowess during training drills, but now he can't detect any trace of her aura. He wonders if she has any connections to the people she's with. Kashmir then asks if he really is who he claims to be, noting that it doesn't seem like he's lying, but he still has questions. Jin invites him to go ahead. Kashmir asks why Jin is traveling with a dragon, mentioning that since ancient times, dragons have been known to make contracts with magicians who possess a special power, typically a zipple rather than a run candle. Kashmir then inquires if Jin's family knows he's accompanied by a dragon. Jin responds that they do not know. He warns that if this information were to leak, his family wouldn't take it lightly. He remarks that Jin is discussing a significant secret that could cost him his life, suggesting that what matters isn't merely that he's a run candle. He then asks Jin to explain the reason behind this alliance with the dragon. Instead of answering directly, Jin asks why he sought to meet with the dragon. He says that since Jin shared a big secret, he'll share one in return. He mentions that he and Fit are the guardians of the girl that they found this morning. And Julia said she saw a cat transform into a person which is why he came to investigate. Jin asks if he believes the words of a child. Kashmir replies that his daughter is no ordinary child. She's a contractor with As Mill. Jin clarifies if he means the Lord of Sight. Kashmir confirms this, adding that a contractor of As Mill wouldn't misinterpret an object or event as the Lord of Sight grants precise vision. He notes that many powerful people would do anything to become a contractor with As Mill, so he's cautious about revealing this information so easily. Murakan, sensing something off, moves closer to Kashmir. He questions how Julia could be a contractor if there's no dragon around, pointing out that he didn't sense any dragon energy nearby. Jin observes that Asmil's dragons are known for their strong bond with their contractors, so unusually they would leave a child alone, indicating something strange is happening. He says he's unsure of the full context, but it seems to revolve around that fact. Murakan asks what he's referring to. Kashmir explains that Julia's guardian dragon disappeared about a year ago, possibly involving the Zippel family or the Bement Empire, though that's just speculation. Murakan responds that it doesn't make sense. No dragon is foolish enough to be kidnapped, and certainly not for a whole year. He then asks if Julia is about five years old. Kashmir confirms this, saying that's correct. Murakan points out that Julia really is Asmil's contractor. Then, if the dragon isn't nearby, she could soon go insane or become disabled due to the lack of the dragon's protective presence. Kashmir is shocked to hear this. Murakan elaborates, emphasizing that Asmil's contractors can see the future. However, most humans aren't aware that this ability places a significant strain on a dragon's mental state. He explains that at Julia's age, she's too young to distinguish between dreams and reality, which is why she hasn't exhibited severe symptoms yet. He explains that if she continues seeing the future without any protection, as she's doing now, her vision will become uncontrollable in a year or two. Jin asks him to elaborate, questioning if seeing the future could truly lead to disability. He responds that it relates to the principle of causality. The one who sees the future must follow what they saw. If they don't, as Mill's punishment begins if someone sees the future and tries to alter it, especially in matters of life and death, they risk severe consequences. 
He adds that contractors who defy the principle of causality are eventually destroyed. Kashmir states that his daughter has lived in a different reality from them due to her ability, and based on reaction, it seems he's starting to understand the gravity of the situation. Kashmir concludes that he must find her guardian dragon as quickly as possible to ensure her safety, and there's no other option. Kashmir kneels down, addressing Murakhan as a mighty dragon. He explains that although the manager didn't mention it, he's the leader of the information center, the Seven Colors, and he's confident in his abilities. However, for a year, he has been unable to find his daughter's guardian dragon. Murakhan, hearing this, remarks that he's now certain that meeting Julia upon their arrival in Takan wasn't just a coincidence. Asmil seems to be seeking their help for his young contractor. He then asks Murakhan, the mighty dragon, to intervene. Murakhan dismisses the request, saying that he can't do much, even if asked. He points to Jin, suggesting that the decision rests with him. Jin approaches Kashmir, asking him to stand up. He acknowledges that although they don't have a deep relationship, this matter concerns the safety and the well-being of a child. He suggests that they proceed rationally and join forces to search for Julia's guardian dragon. Kashmir expresses his gratitude, saying he will not forget their kindness. He thinks that even though things turned out better than expected, there's still a sense of unease. If the Seven Colors couldn't locate the missing dragon, then finding it might require information from the Run Candle or Zippel families. Murakhan asks if Tekken is aligned with the Zippel family, to which Jin responds that Tekken is just a city unaffiliated with anyone. He seems satisfied, then asks Kashmir if his information network is truly that capable, inquiring if they have data on dragons. Kashmir confirms they do, explaining that they know which continent each dragon inhabits. Murakhan is pleased and asks for all the information on dragons in the Bement Empire. Jin quickly advises against revealing this information, but Murakhan dismisses him, stating that this approach is like a last resort. Traditionally, he adds, dragons are believed to know everything. Meanwhile, Enya approaches Quikintel, holding a newspaper, and asks her to look at it. Quikintel inquires if she has arrived. Enya responds that it's news about Sir Jin again and asks if he isn't truly amazing. She remarks that he's the same age as them, but is already a five-star. Enya expresses surprise and asks if she could also become like him. She confirms that as a Lord's contractor, she can also achieve such heights. Enya questions if that's really true. She reassures her, stating that compared to the child of a family with a guardian who is a black-haired guy, she, as the contractor of Ulta, the Lord of Time, holds much more potential. She then instructs Enya to go home and not come out until she returns. Enya asks if something has happened. She responds, saying not really. It's just that something dark has appeared. After a while, Jin is flying while sitting on Murakan, who has transformed into his dragon form. Murakan warns him that soon, very soon, he'll release his presence, and the dragons residing in Bimit will come crawling out on their own. He advises Jin to hide well to avoid being seen. Jin covers his face and acknowledges the advice, saying he's ready. Murakan says they're starting now, and then they begin descending rapidly. The scene shifts to a flashback, where Kashmir hands Murakan some papers, saying here it is, the list of dragons active within the Bimit regions. As he requested, Murakan reviews the papers and remarks, so they are hiding here. He starts to say something, but then changes his mind, dismissing it with a casual, never mind, it should be fine. Jin asks if there is any problem, but Murakan assures him there is none. He mentions that dealing with dragons can be risky, but suggests they move on, saying they have a long way to go. As they start to leave, Kashmir calls out to Murakan, addressing him as a great dragon and asking him to wait. Murakan tells him to drop the formality, saying he's not a cult leader and asks him just to use his name. Kashmir responds to Sir Murakan, thanking him and bowing, then humbly requesting that Murakan take care of things so that he can save his beloved daughter. He tells Kashmir that before he leaves, there are two important details to keep in mind. First, until the dragon returns, he needs to keep his daughter physically active throughout the day. By exhausting her energy, Asmil's influence will naturally weaken. He instructs him to play with her from the moment she wakes up, whether it's running around or doing anything else that makes her tired, ensuring she falls asleep easily. Kashmir acknowledges the advice and promises to keep his daughter engaged and exhausted. He then asks about the second detail. Murakan mentions ice candies, suggesting Kashmir bring some over since they didn't get a chance to try any because of him. Jilly remarks that he really is a gentleman. Murakan laughs, 
pointing out that she had mentioned wanting to get some ice candies earlier. Jilly clarifies that she was referring to how Murakan tactfully provided additional information to calm Kashmir. Murakan responds that he doesn't really care about the emotions of that kind of creature. The scene shifts to the present. Jin reflects that while Murakan often pretends not to care about others, he's actually quite thoughtful, a trait of their black dragon. Murakan interrupts his thoughts, announcing that it's coming, pointing to a dragon approaching from the opposite direction. He identifies the newcomers as Labus and Until, remarking that they were the ones he beat up the most. Murakan tells Jin to put on his helmet. Jin comments on how much he must have gone around beating them up for them to show up so quickly upon sensing his presence. He nonchalantly explains that anyone who enters his territory gets a beating. That's just how it was back in the day. Jin asks if he doesn't feel a sense of pride about it. Labus calls out to Murakan, asking why he's here. Murakan responds by addressing Labus as the Earth Dragon and Untail, declaring that he's awoken from a long slumber for a task that requires their assistance. Untail, seemingly apprehensive, says that the great ruler of the tall mountains and close friend of Soldaret. He is well known and they wish they could help him, but this isn't the ideal time. Please avoid this area. Labus urges Murakan to leave quickly, pointing out that a young contractor is still in this region and that Until doesn't wish for any conflict on the coast of Bement. Murakan, undeterred, asks if they're daring to order him to retreat, declaring that there's nowhere under the heavens that Murakan must avoid. Untile seems exasperated, suggesting that Murakan should just flee, explaining that everything's in chaos due to the disruptive presence he's been spreading. Murakan asks what Labus is talking about. Labus explains that Quickentel is flying over and planning to kill him. Jin asks if they mean the silver dragon Quickentel, then asks what his relationship is with the guardian dragon of the Time Lord Ulta. Murakan reveals that Quickentel is his ex-girlfriend. Labus pleads with Murakan, saying he's begging him and asks if he can leave, emphasizing that their contractor is still just a child and could get hurt if caught in the crossfire. Until warns that the other dragons don't know he has awakened yet, and if he doesn't leave now, the news will spread. Murakan tells Jin to hold on tight, as a beam of light was about to hit them. Murakan dodged it. Labus, panicking, suggests they flee and cursed Murakan. Jin asks what is going on. Murakan tells him to stay focused as more shots are coming their way. The attacks are ultimate skills above 8 star level, and she's firing those repeatedly. Quikantel arrive, cursing at Murakan, saying he should have died right then and there, and demands to know what he was thinking, showing up here with that audacious look on his face. Jin asks if they really have to fight against that monster. Murakan indicates that it looks like they do. Jin asks how long he dated her. Murakan replies 500 years, adding that it's about 5 years in human years. Then he tells Jin to stab her with Bradamante whenever he gets the chance. He hesitates, noting that she's still his ex and asks if stabbing her isn't too harsh. Murakan dismisses his concern, pointing out that he never sticks around with those who lack power. He advises that if things get bad, Jin should pour all his power into one strike, saying that it would take that much just to land a hit on her. Quickentel transforms into her dragon form, declaring that it's too late to run, and that she's going to bury him at sea. Murakan urges Quickentel to wait and calm down, acknowledging that she despises him, but pointing out that they have more important matters to attend to before settling any personal issues. Instead of listening, she launches a magical spell at him, but he dodges and begins to retreat. Quickentel chases after him, attacking with increased ferocity, even attempting to bite him. Murakan questions why she's so agitated as they start clashing with each other. She throws another magical spell at him. What the hell? At this range, Murakan exclaimed, and quickly spreads his black shadow aura to hide in the shadow realm, hoping to buy some time. Jin observes the chaotic scene and remarks that it's fortunate he tagged along. Otherwise, if Murakan had been caught by the silver dragon, he would have died. Murakan assures Jin that he won't die, adding that no matter how strong Quickentel is, she can't enter this space. He acknowledges that creating an opening to calm her down won't be easy, suggesting they find a way to pacify her through conversation. However, she disperses the shadow and hawks him, saying that if he thought him hiding in the shadow realm would work, he's sadly mistaken. Murakan is surprised and asks how she did that. She scolds him, pointing out that he doesn't realize how much weaker he has become. If he still believes he's the same as before, he's sorely mistaken. Murakan attempts to defuse the situation, telling her to stop and reminding her of their past. He explains that he came here with a question, but she retorts that even thinking about their past makes her want to tear him into 10,000 pieces. She attacks, but Murakan bites her and asks her to calm down. 
wondering if she's reacting this way just because they broke up. She retorts that him thinking that it was just a breakup is why he's getting his ass beaten, then punches him in the face. Moroccan signals Jin to act. He jumps into action, ready to attack Quikintel. She is taken aback, exclaiming, What a human! Jin realizes that her outer skin is hard to pierce, even with Murakan's teeth. This suggests that it will be difficult for Jin to cause any significant damage with a single strike. However, he sees a small gap and notices remnants of Murakan's Shadow Kai around the area. Using the power of Shadow Kai liberation, he strikes with his sword, piercing through and stabbing her. She screams in pain as he cuts her arm and wings. Murakan commends him, saying he has used up all his power. But still, good job. Jin feels exhausted and wonders if he has just become a dragon slayer out of nowhere. He acknowledges his comment, saying, All right, now let's hope she's calmed down a little. Jin asks if that was the end of the battle. Mirakan responds that it's far from over. Most regular dragons would die from such a blow, but she is different. Dragons that control time are not easily defeated. Jin, concerned, asks if they might end up missing before they even find the missing dragon. Jin stands on Murakan's hand, observing her. He asks if she's rewinding time. Murakan explains that this is why authority and magic are separate, adding that while it's a powerful ability, it consumes a lot of energy. He advises Jin not to move an inch, just in case. Quikintel reverts to her human form. Murakan asks if she's calmed down a bit, joking that he didn't know. She still had such strong feelings for him to the point where she went crazy. Murakan then asks if they didn't break up on good terms. Quikintel is angry, reminding him that he dumped her giving her no room to discuss it. She sarcastically asks if that's what he calls breaking up on good terms. Murakan admits that she gets angry whenever he mentions breaking up, but clarifies that he didn't cheat. It was simply a case of their personalities not matching. Jin reflects on how this is a conversation between dragons who have lived for thousands of years. Murakan tries to shift the focus, saying he didn't come here to fight, but to ask her something. Quikintel tells Murakan to wait before he continues and asks about the human with him. Wondering if he's Soldaret's contractor, Murakan dismisses the question, emphasizing that it's not what's important right now, pointing out that one of their own is in grave danger. Kikantel is unimpressed, labeling Murachin as despicable, reminding him of the many dragons he's killed. She seems baffled by his sudden concern, questioning if he's playing games with her and asking if he realizes how many dragons died at his hands. Murachin acknowledges her point and explains that among those dragons was her older brother's enemy, whom he killed as an act of revenge. He clarifies that he did it for someone he had no connection to, implying that it wasn't his choice to get involved. He admits it might be his fault for asking her, saying he could have asked another dragon instead. Quikintel takes a moment to compose herself, recognizing that whenever she sees Murakan, she becomes emotional. She suggests that he go ahead and ask her what he wants, apologizing for what she just said. He explains that one of Asmil's guardian dragons recently went missing. Quikintel asks if he means Tekin's Latry. Murakan confirms, saying yeah, there was a name like that. Jin realizes they're finally getting to the heart of the matter. She remarks that it's strange because Latry was taken by Valletta not long ago. Jin recalls that Valletta is a wind dragon, one of Melzir, the Lord of Wind's dependents, and the guardian dragon of the Zippel family's vice head, Andre. He begins to suspect that this could be connected to the Zippel family. She states that the Zipples mentioned they would teach Latry the dragon language magic, suggesting that they might need to relocate to avoid any traps. She offers to guide them to her place. A while later, in a forest on the outskirts of Bemin's capital, Jin Runcandle introduces himself to Quikintel, explaining that he's Soldaret's contractor. She acknowledges that she already knows he's Temur's descendant, identifies him as the youngest son, Jin. Murakan is surprised, asking how she knows. Quikintel responds that it's obvious because he's giving off the same energy as Temur, and mentions that the three of them used to spend a lot of time together 1,000 years ago, adding that she just guessed he was the youngest based on the Guardian Dragon's reaction. She takes a sip of tea, suggesting they get to the main topic. She explains that Valletta took Latri about a year ago. Murakan confirms that they lured Latrian by promising to teach dragon language magic, remarking that this doesn't sound good. She acknowledges that while it might be true, the current contractor of Asmil is too young to control the authority. She asks if it would be dangerous if the guardian dragon isn't by her side. Murakan agrees, saying Valletta should understand that as well. She says it makes sense and questions if there's a hidden motive behind this. Murakan picks up on her phrasing, asking if she knows something based on her comment as expected. She explains she visited Bimin and mentioned introducing Latry. However, she seemed fixated on her contractor, asking for an opportunity to meet without a clear reason. 
She admits that her temper might have prompted her to react aggressively, but she refrained because her contractor's identity had already been revealed, given that many in Bemant's upper class have close ties with the Zippel family. Acting on her temper would have put her contractor in danger. Jin remarks that it's odd how her contractor's identity was revealed while As Mills' contractor hasn't been disclosed. He suggests it's suspicious how they discovered this information and approached Latri. Murakan agrees, noting that it's peculiar and questions whether contractor detection magic was developed while he was asleep. She insists it's impossible. No one can detect a contractor's identity until they manifest their authority. Even if such magic existed, she questions how it would benefit those who possess it. Jin outlines two potential benefits the Zippel family could gain. First, they can minimize risks and eliminate contractors outside their domain. Second, by killing the contractor, the Zippel family might secure a chance to make a contract with a lord. He reflects that it's not merely a chance to make a contract. They likely have a specific method in his past life, the contractor for Ulta. The Lord of Time was officially introduced at the stone statue. He recalls that 10 years from now, the contractor was a pure-blooded Zippel, leading him to believe that if they kill a contractor, they can then form a contract with that lord. This realization leads him to suspect that Julia's guardian dragon was kidnapped for this reason, as he hadn't heard about the Princess of Takan in his past life. She points out that there are various assumptions regarding Solder, its contractor, indicating that it's hard to accept that the Zipples would need another. She questions why they would target other contractors if they already have so many, suggesting that Jin might be overly suspicious because they're his enemy. He accuses her of telling lies even though she doesn't believe him, stating that while he's unsure how it is for dragons, human greed knows no bounds. Even if they reach the peak, they're never satisfied and always crave more. He reminds her that the Zippel family has held power for thousands of years, so it's not unusual for them to do whatever it takes to maintain it. She acknowledges that the Zippel leadership is indeed up to something, questioning why he's pretending not to know, and wondering if he's afraid of them. Murakan interjects, asking for calm, and pointing out that everyone is aware of the Zippel's greed, and while he dislikes admitting it, their skill is undeniable. He emphasizes that caution is never a bad thing, and suggests she leave Beamant. She laughs, remarking that he's changed significantly, as it's rare to see him reading the room. She agrees to have her contractor flee first, then offers to help. Murakan is surprised, asking her what she means. She explains that she needs to confront Villetta to find out the truth, pointing out that if what they say is accurate, the Zipples are likely looking for an opportunity to strike. She mentions that if she calls, they will probably come running. Quick and tell moves to leave but places a hand on Jin's shoulder. She remarks that she feels a sense of duty toward Tamer, and seeing one of his descendants reminds her of the old days. She says that even his cockiness resembles him. She then adds that she's going to call Valletta. Just then, Enya arrives, announcing her return. She sees the others and asks who they are. Quick and tell scolds her for coming outside, but then corrects herself, saying this is actually better. She introduces Enya as the the contractor of Volta, the Lord of Time, and introduces Jin as the contractor Murakan is protecting. Enya is taken aback and excitedly asks if it's really Jin if young master Jin is standing right in front of her. Jin, surprised by the reaction, asks what's going on. Quickentel covers her face with her hand, explaining that she forgot to mention that Enya has a little bit of a fantasy about him. Enya enthusiastically asks Jin for an autograph. Quickentel asks Enya to maintain her dignity as a contractor. Enya, realizing her mistake, bows an apology, explaining that she lost her composure upon seeing Jin in person after only having seen him in newspapers. She then introduces herself, admitting that she's a commoner, but attends the academy on a scholarship. Jin recalls hearing that Ulta places great importance on the contractor's bloodline, wondering if Enya's talents are so exceptional that her status as a commoner didn't matter. He reassures her that there's nothing to be sorry about acknowledging that he's unsure how to react to her enthusiastic welcome. Enya asks if she can express more excitement, but he quickly declines. Quick and tell shifts the focus, reminding Enya that she had told her not to leave the house earlier. Enya explains that it was a bit lonely at home, so she thought she might feel better by being around Kikintel. As she was thinking this, she happened to see Jin in person, adding that it was fortunate she came to find Quick and tell. Jin reflects on her status as a commoner and an academy scholarship student, Noting that Bemant's nobility must have bullied her extensively without realizing her importance. 
He finds it unsurprising, considering that's why he never associated with those Academy idiots. As he puts it, those ignoble idiots. Enya asks Jin why he's here. Jin reveals that he's here for her, explaining that there's a possibility that someone is targeting her as Ulta's current contractor and invites her to come with him. He promises to ensure her safety and extends his hand. Enya, astonished, asks if he means to take her with him and becomes visibly excited. She exclaims that her prayers to the great Ulta are finally rewarded, expressing her devotion. Quickentel intervenes, telling her that's enough. Enya, however, remains eager, stating that she's ready to go, chanting all hail Ulta, all hail the Lord of Time. Quickentel abruptly knocks her unconscious, remarking that she was worried Enya might not want to go. But clearly, her concern was unfounded. Seeing how enthusiastic she became after Jin's invitation, it seems like she'd follow him even into the Run Candles underground prison. Jin is confused, questioning her mention of an underground prison, stating that their clan doesn't have anything like that. Quikintel responds that there's no need to act like he doesn't know, adding that there's even a dragon there. Both Jin and Murakan are taken aback, asking what she means, with Murakan collapsing onto the sofa unconscious. Quikintel observes his condition, noting that he couldn't even stay awake for a minute. Quikantel explains that her offer to help Jin isn't just because of her loyalty to Tamer, or concern for Enya's safety. The primary reason is because of the exhausted dragon who just fell over. She says Murakan hasn't yet realized how weak he's become, and she had withheld her criticism. But it's clear he's no longer strong enough to confront Valletta. If they need to fight Valletta, she offers to step in. Jin asks if Valletta is really that strong. Quikantel confirms that while Valletta is indeed powerful, the issue is Murakan's weakened state. She mentions that her attack at sea, which would have been laughable to Murakan 1,000 years ago, had a significant impact. Considering his current condition, she suggests that they need a place to stay until Valletta arrives, offering her a place as a refuge. He asks if he could request that favor. Kikantel says he can, as long as he doesn't object, but cautions that he'll need to convince Murakan, who's bound to complain about staying at his ex's house. Jin reflects on the silver dragon Kikantel realizing she's more thoughtful than he initially believed. He agrees to the arrangement, acknowledging that he'll need to handle Murakan's reaction. Quikantel says, okay, then it's about time. Jin asks what she means. She explains that in about 10 seconds, Enya will wake up, suggesting he carefully choose his words to explain the current situation to her. Jin is surprised, wondering how Enya could wake up so quickly after being knocked out, noting that even a trained martial artist wouldn't recover so rapidly. Just then, Enya awakened, calling out to Sir Jin. Quikantel remarks that there's a realm beyond logic or reasoning, indicating that Enya's recovery might be part of it, then leaves the explanation to him. After a while, Enya sits across from Jin and asks him to confirm that there is a faction targeting the contractor of Takan, and that their next target might be her. She then says she believes it because it comes from Sir Jin, remarking that the idea of schemes, adventures involving dragons, and Sir Jin himself sounds somewhat romantic. Jin acknowledges her perspective, agreeing that she could see it that way. Enya comments that it's always better to be optimistic and adds that in any case, she'll need to prepare to move to Tekken with her family. Enya asks when she should leave. Jin suggests the sooner, the better. She responds that she can get ready by tomorrow, mentioning that her family consists of her seven-year-old brother and an old dog named Poofy. Jin says that's manageable, urging her to start packing immediately. Quikantel advises her to go home and make preparations today, adding that she should leave before it gets too late. As she starts to leave, she says she'll see him tomorrow. Quikantel mentions that she'll need to make an excuse to the Academy, suggesting that she is sick to avoid drawing suspicion. Jin agrees, noting that if they claim she's dropping out, it might provoke further inquiries. Quikantel concludes that now they just need to focus on dealing with Valletta. Just then, a man wearing a cap calls from outside the room asking if anyone's inside and mentioning that he's come to ask for some firewood. Quickentel finds this odd, pointing out that there's plenty of wood around, wondering why someone would come to ask for firewood. Jin tells her to wait, asking if she really thinks they've come just for firewood. He then suggests that dragons might not all have such a laid-back attitude. He advises her that the person outside is likely from the men's special forces, then covers his face with a mask. Quikantel is taken aback, questioning why they would send special forces. Jin explains that it's probably because of Enya, 
The special forces have likely been monitoring this location, and now they're trying to identify the outsiders that Quickintel brought over. Jin asks about the surveillance, wondering if they have the audacity to keep tabs on him. Quickintel opens the door, and the cap-wearing man says she's inside. She quickly grabs him by the neck, demanding he state clearly if he's with the Beeman Special Forces. He protests, insisting he's not involved in anything like that. She asks who sent him if he's not with the Special Forces. Raz enters the room, explaining that he sent the man and asks Quickintel to release her grip, warning her that if she kills him, the Special Forces will come rushing in. She lets go, acknowledging that Raz is the boss, and declares that if she must kill someone, it might as well be him. She lunges toward Raz, ready to strike, saying that killing him might be the only thing that can calm her rage. Raz remains calm, asking if that would be enough to settle her anger. Quickintel wonders if she can blow off some steam, noting that Raz took a hit head-on and seems unaffected, indicating he's not just an ordinary member of Beeman's Special Affairs Division. She observes his red mask, which is exclusive to the group leaders within Beeman's Special Affairs Division, and the fact that he's a curved sword user. The combination of these traits leads her to conclude that he must be the Emperor's right-hand man, the leader of Group 3 in Beeman's Special Affairs Division, codenamed Raz. He's also recognized as a skilled swordsman among the Run Candles. Jin considers that Raz is undoubtedly powerful, estimating that he's at least at an 8-star level based on the strength of his energy. He's glad he covered his face with Malta's rune. Quickintel remarks that Raz is quite good for a human, acknowledging his strength despite her earlier attack. Raz apologizes if he offended Quickintel, explaining that they had no choice but to confirm the identity of her guests who smuggled themselves into Bement. Now that they have confirmation, he says he's leaving. Quickentel is not impressed, retorting that he's just saying sorry after rudely intruding into her space, pointing out there's a limit to how arrogant someone can be. Raz casually picks up a box, mentioning that Enya left the house quickly just now. He asks if Quickentel doesn't find it risky for Enya to be out so late at night alone. He warns her that if she chooses to fight him here, she might have the upper hand, but that could endanger Enya if something were to happen to her during that time. He asks if she still wants to continue implying that doing so could have severe consequences. Raz concludes that if she chooses not to escalate things, he'll let it go this time. However, he cautions her that the next time she will have to stake something she treasures dearly, putting everything she's protected at risk. He advises her to prepare to lose everything, thing because of her actions today, then bids her farewell until next time. After a while, Raz walks through the forest, instructing his guard that he's confirmed the appearance of the smugglers, he tells them to go back and find out their identities, adding that for the time being, all observations on the Silver Dragon will be paused. His guard asks if they shouldn't continue monitoring Quickintel and the smugglers' movements. Raz advises against it, explaining that further provocation could lead to a worse situation. Assuring them that he'll take responsibility, he orders them to withdraw. He notices a cut on his hand, which makes him suspect that they're up to something. He cautions that everyone will be in danger ordering a halt to close range surveillance until there's any unusual activity. His guard acknowledges the command, saying he understands. Meanwhile, Quickintel slams her fist on the table, cursing at herself for leaving Enya in this wretched town. She acknowledges that if Jin and Murakan hadn't arrived, she can only imagine what could have happened. Jin suggests they should be grateful they managed to prevent a worse outcome and proposes making Enya's safety their top priority. Quickintel agrees, saying they need to make their move the following day. The scene shifts to the next morning, where Jin and Quickintel are standing on a mountaintop, watching ships departing from the coast. Jin remarks that he's relieved to have found a merchant ship heading to Tekin and reassures her that he paid the captain a significant amount, ensuring Enya a safe passage. He adds that Murakin is acting as her escort, so she doesn't need to worry. Quickintel retorts that Murakin's involvement concerns her. She prepares to leave, mentioning that she's going to contact Villetta right away indicating that Jin will be able to meet with her once Murakan returns. The scene shifts to a week later. Murakan is standing in front of a house when Jin approaches and praises him for his work. Murakan comments that Quickintel is a lot more bitter than he expected. Jin asks why he's bringing this up out of nowhere. Murakan reveals that this house was built when he and Quickintel were together in the past, adding that he understands why she's letting them stay here. Jin asks if his cold heart is warming up. Murakan dismisses the idea, saying that reviving old feelings is difficult. 
However, Murakan reflects that the memories from 1,000 years ago in a house just like this remind him of the good times he had with Tamer and Quikintel. He acknowledges that despite everything they did back then, it was always fun. He feels a pang of sadness after recalling those memories. Jin notices and asks if something's wrong. Murakan dismisses it, saying it's nothing, that his head just suddenly hurt. Quikantel appears and mockingly says how pitiful he is, asking if he's already exhausted from a bit of flying. Murakan snaps back, telling her to be quiet, insisting that no matter how weak he's become, he won't get tired from something so trivial. Jin urges him to get it together. She informs them that Valletta's response came in, and the meeting is scheduled for tomorrow night on a deserted island off the southern coast of Bement. Jin asks what her plan is when she meets Valletta. Quikintel clarifies that she'll ask about Asmil's guardian dragon, Latri, and if he acts clueless, she'll resort to force. Jin finds her approach refreshing, appreciating her straightforwardness. Murakin says that's not bad, but if it were his situation, he'd avoid getting into something tedious like this. He then realizes that since Quikintel doesn't have Enya with her, she can do whatever she wants. Quikintel dismisses him, saying she plans to fight alone, implying she doesn't need his help. Murakan retorts that no matter how weak he's become, he doesn't need sympathy from his ex. She insists that it's not sympathy. This is about Enya. And the other reason is about dragon honor. Quikintel adds that this means Valletta is definitely coming alone, asking if Murakan believes she would lose to someone like that, suggesting he just relaxed. She actually thinks that, in reality, they probably won't be coming alone. If they indeed kidnap Latri and are planning something suspicious with the contract, they will likely arrive fully prepared, but she can't tell Murakan that. She transforms into her dragon form and flies away from the area. After a while, Andre Zippel says that it's an honor to meet the Silver Dragon of Time, Quikantel, and that he's pleased to make her acquaintance. Valletta the Wind Dragon and the Vice Head of Zippel and Melzier's contractor Andre Zippel. Quikantel points out to Valletta that he said he would come by himself. He responds by saying that when he received her letter, he was with Andre, and because Andre was also interested in the story about Alta's contractor, he decided to bring him along. He hopes that she understands and doesn't mind. She says he has been quite rude recently. He responds by suggesting that if she's ready to get to the main topic of discussion, they should proceed as he has something important to talk about regarding Ulta's contract. She inquires about Latri's current location. He chuckles and says that he realizes he's been misled. Of course, that's what she's been thinking about this whole time. She insists that he answer her question, reminding him that he took Latri away one year ago, and since then, Asmil's contractor hasn't been able to find his guardian dragon. He says he's unsure what answer will satisfy her, but he assures her that Latri is doing fine. She retorts, asking how he dares to joke with her. He says he doesn't understand what relationship she has with Asmil's contractor, but it's not advisable for her to get involved in Zippel's matters. She retorts that he's truly lost his mind. Kidnapping a young dragon who doesn't understand the ways of the world is a grave crime. Jin and Murakan hide behind some rocks as Murakan curses at Valletta. Jin comments on how arrogant he is. Valletta states that he realizes this argument will lead nowhere and conjures a windstorm. He proposes that they make a deal. If she hands over the contract, he will spare her life. She scoffs at his audacity, calling him nothing more than an old lizard. He responds by attacking her, declaring that if that's her attitude, then she should prepare to die. She transforms into a dragon and swiftly moves back, countering with her own offer. If he returns Latri to her immediately, she'll ensure his demise is painless. Andre Zippel laughs as he observes that she has brushed off Valletta's attacks quite effortlessly, and then he begins gathering his mana in a magical staff. He remarks that it's the first time in a long while that he can give it his all, an attack with full power. Jin notices this and realizes that he's witnessing a nine-star mage's mana for the first time since his rebirth. He recalls that although Andre Zippel was rejected by the Run Candle family, he is a member of the affluent Zippel family, so he wonders what Andre's true level of power might be. Andre Zippel calls out to his allies, saying it's time to regroup. The Silver Dragons of Time are ready. She recognizes the danger and tries to dodge it, but she finds herself unable to move and realizes she can't fly. Andre Zippel declares that it seems the wind has turned against her, pointing out that all the wind on this island belongs to him. He asserts that he is the king of Melger, the lord of wind, and that no one can fly without his permission, emphasizing 
that she has never been a match for him. Valletta also hurls a spell at her. She dismisses their efforts, mocking them by asking if that's the best they can do. He tells her that she isn't good enough and that he will show her how it's truly done. She underestimated him if she thought he could only control the wind. He unleashes a raging thunder spell, shouting for her to die. Jin urges Murakan to help her, but Murakan refuses, saying not yet. He explains that while it's true that Quikintel became complacent, those fools are also overconfident. As the spell strikes, Quikintel uses her power, and Jin senses that time has stopped. She redirects Andre Zippel's attack, sending it in a different direction. Andre Zippel is shocked, exclaiming that the power to control time, even to halt magic, is something he hasn't seen in ages. Quikintel vows to rip his obnoxious mouth apart. Andre Zippel remarks that she got incredibly angry after just one spell and orders him to launch the next attack. However, Valletta doesn't move. Andre Zippel demands that Valletta hurry up and act, but Valletta finds his body paralyzed, realizing that this must be the effect of time manipulation. Quikintel seizes the opportunity to attack, grabbing Andre Zippel's tail and throwing him across the area. He crashes into a pile of rocks and screams in pain. Andre Zippel calls for Valletta to get up. She says to go ahead and keep rambling and that Valletta is an insignificant lowly lizard. Andre orders Silver Dragon to stop. Silver Dragon responds, shut up and just watch. It'll be his turn next, and thinks that she used too much of her authority to take care of Valletta, and thinks she needs Jin and Murakan's help to take care of the mage. Andre Zippel says she went too far. Such arrogance only befits the strong. Murakan asks if that is a devil stone and says no way. It should have been destroyed already, and asks how he has that while looking at the monster of Andre Zippel. Murakan believes it's the Devil Stone. When danger falls upon the world, the Lords created it as a safety measure to prevent the end of the world. He thinks that in the end. The stone that holds the power of all the Lords is destroyed by the Lords because the stone is so powerful that it could destroy the world instead. He wonders why an object that should have been destroyed is in the mage's hands. He calls Quikintel while Silver Dragon asks what this is. Andre Zippel laughs and says they exemplify the strength the weak should show in front of the strong, where he should be and asks where the weak should be in the face of the strong, while Andre Zippel asks who the black dragon is, stating there are only two black dragons left in this world, and indicating that he's looking at one Jin's Murakan. He asks if he woke up from his thousand-year slumber. Then that means the boy next to him is his contractor, and he says he's the youngest one, the one who left the house not too long ago, Jin. He says he came here with plans to take Ulta's contractor, but his meal has gotten bigger, and he says now, to be fair, he will wake up his friend who is sleeping. Some dark energy has gathered around Valletta. Valletta says he shouldn't have saved his energy in the first place, and says he's sorry, old friend. While Black Dragon says he thought he was really dead and abused him, saying it's been a while, Black Dragon tells him to get lost, while Valletta says that although he has gotten weaker, his words are still as harsh. He says to go back to sleep, Murakan attacks him. Black Dragon counterattacks and says it's good. He'd have been dispirited if he were too weak, he says. Be happy, Murakan. He's going to be recorded as the one who killed a legend, Murakan, and says to stop kidding himself. Andre Zippel asks if they will continue fighting too, and says he is going to go easy on her. But now that she has seen this stone, he needs to kill them all. Andre says having a child interfering in this won't change anything. Jin used a flashbang spell, and Andre couldn't see Jin attack. Valletta rushes to save Andre and attacks Jin. Murakan screams for Jin to dodge. Jin hits the wall, and now two attacks are launched at him. With no time to dodge, both high-level attacks. Jin has only one choice. He grabs the necklace and breaks it, and a huge white light appears. While someone says that Jin hasn't even said goodbye to her before leaving, but it seems like he has a tough situation on his hands. Jin thinks that with his current strength, it's suicide to intervene in the battle between the dragons, so he has no other choice but to call out for his big sister Luna. After blocking both attacks easily, Andre Zippel looks at her and thinks, if she is the White Whale. She says that her opponents are the Vice Patriarch of Zippel and his Wind Dragon, saying good that's about the right level to call her over for. She says to the youngest brother that he was somehow holding on for that long against those opponents and asks if he is hurt anywhere. Jin says that he was actually almost getting close to his limit and thanks her for coming. She asks Andre Zippel if he is going to continue being mute and says she would like him to explain what sort of business he has with his younger brother. Jin Runkhandle thinks that her opponents were the Vice Patriarch of Zippel and the Wind Dragon who had been resurrected using the artifact imbued with divine powers. He thinks it was an uncertain situation, even if his elder sister had come, but now he has started to feel assured and thinks this battle is already over. Morcon arrives saying they should stand back, 
Morcon says he's sorry because they had complete control over the wind. He hasn't been able to stop them, he says. Anyway, he has got a good sister. If she had come even a brief moment later, they would have been done for, saying they survived thanks to him, and says he certainly didn't expect this to think the white whale would appear. But with this, one thing has become certain. Andre Zippel says, Jin has broken their oath with Zippel and says Luna, her sibling, used magic and says Zippel will not overlook this easily. She says she sees it, but doesn't worry. That truth will never reach his clan. Andre Zippel questions how she dares to act beyond her place, and his monster roars at her. She attacks him and knocks him out. She says all the Zippel she has met were all talk, and it looks like the Vice Patriarch is no different. She asks Valletta if he is going to remain in his true form, and says it's better for him since there are more places to cut. Valletta transforms into a human, and Andre Zippel calls him. He says he understands and holds his magical spear. He thinks that power is not magic. It's similar to authority and also bears similarity with the energy of demons, which is why the Wind Dragon is going all out. She says it looks like he needs some time to properly use that artifact. She says, seeing the absolute state of the Vice Patriarch of Zippel and the Wind Dragon to rely on that crude device, he asks if he truly thinks something like that could save him. Valletta says she's an insignificant wench and attacks her, asking what she thinks she knows to run her mouth like that. She counterattacks and they try to defeat each other while attacking again and again. Valletta gets hurt. She says in the end this was the limit of his powers and that it looks like he doesn't have anything else to show her, so she'll end this quickly. She uses Run Candle's third final strike, Meteor Shower, to attack him. Zed Run Candle says that their clan swordsmanship is like that of a conqueror, destructive and relentless competition, attainment and relinquishment. The mind of Run Candle is imbued within the sword as a whole. He explains that for that reason, a Run Candle have no such thing as sword forms. They are designed only to kill the enemy. He mentions the existence of a secret move and a final move, while Jin thinks about the third final move, Meteor Shower, considering it blindingly beautiful and despairingly strong. When White Whale attacks Valletta, Valletta asks Andre Zippel if he is all right, as he is just standing still, and he tells Andre to come to his senses. Andre Zippel questions if this makes any sense, mentioning that she's not displaying the authority of a lord through a contract or using an ancient artifact. He wonders how something like this could be possible with the strength of a mere human. Meanwhile, Valletta says Andre just needs to survive. If he can survive, there's still a chance to win with the magical Devil Stone. They'll be able to turn this situation around, he says. Even if he dies protecting him, he'd just have to bring him back to life with that. He thinks, right? It's not over yet. So long as he has this magical Devil Stone, he won't die. So long as he has this, he is unkillable. She says she still has much more to go until she reaches her father's sword skill. While she stands near the broken wing, of Valletta. She thinks this much should be good study material for Jin, and it'll provoke him as well. She thinks that if she doesn't reach her father's strength, in the end, the youngest will learn much from him. This while, a monster appears behind her. She says now this is hurting her pride a bit, and she'll get a bit annoyed if he acts this persistently in front of her brother. Jin asks what that is, and Murakan says it's for certain now that Zippel has created a Devil Stone using contractors. He asks what Murakan means by a Devil Stone, and Murakan replies, it's like a weapon created for lords to keep each other in check. Thankfully, it looks weak at the moment. However, that doesn't change the fact that it's dangerous. Black Dragon says they need to escape this place, but Jin tells Murakan to wait. Jin suggests they should fight together, as he can't leave an opponent that dangerous to his sister. Black Dragon disagrees, saying his sister can fully handle that level on her own, and right now, they're getting in the way. So let's fall back. He thinks about the past by forming a contract with a Solderet, and he meets Murakan. Jin started out with luck and abilities incomparable to others, yet what even he is now? He thinks he has to fall back without even making proper resistance, and at this rate, it'll be the exact same as that time. He thinks not again. He can't feel the powerlessness again. He thinks he must become even stronger and knows he is intrepid, but he's showing this kind of fighting spirit. After seeing that, Murakan thinks he's so proud that he wants to bite him. He does not let the fighting spirit burning in his talent to burn out. If he doesn't, he will become the best in the future, and I, Murakan, will watch over his back. Luna asks if he does think that he can kill her, just because his appearance changed a bit, and if he's flailing in his own delusions. Andre attacks her, but she blocks his attack. Andre says right now there are 12 lords locked inside him. He asks her what is within her and if she does not have anything but a sword that is twice her size. He says to accept defeat and surrender, here and now. Even if her father were here, no one could face him. She says for a swordsman, 
A single sword is enough, and says if he had faced her with the magic he has spent his entire life honing and improving upon, he might have been able to witness at least half of the martial strength she has accumulated. She says she'll show him as someone sympathetic, what can't be reached with that mere crude object, and what a sword that has been honored and improved to become strong is. Andre thinks about the red aura and how he has faced countless knights, but never like this, and thinks, no, what does that even matter? He thinks right now he has reached the level of a lord. He says, fine, come witness this power and he will make her arrogant wench realize what powerlessness is, while she uses the sword skill Blood Moon to attack him. Luna attack caused Andre Devil Core to explode. Luna thinks she's going to get caught up in this, while Jin calls her and says to take his hand as Murakan flies near her. She thinks that today the youngest will be the one to save her, and she grabs his hand. On the other side, Raz comes to Amir Bement, who asks if the island has completely disappeared. Raz says yes, a strange vortex has also swallowed up nearby matter, and a large amount of mana was detected around that area. Although humans also had a part to play in it, what's certain is that it was the Silver Dragon and the Wind Dragon's magic power. Amir Bement asks what he means by Wind Dragon. He replies that the Division suspected that it was Valletta from the Zippel family, and before the incident, it was reported that Valletta had crossed the border. He says it seems like the Wind Dragon has died and asks about the human mana. Did he find out who it was? He says it seems to be the contractors. Amir Bement asks what he means by seems to be. Raz replies that they suspect the contractors and their guardian dragons and an ominous energy. He says he thinks it has something to do with a thing that the Zipples are creating. Amir Bement asks what about Andre Zippel? Raz replies they are still looking into it. Angrily, Amir Bement says recently many things have been removed from the reports, and he asked if he has yet to determine who Quickentel's guests were. Raz replies he has no excuse for his failure. Amir Bement says that they have no clue what is happening, and it is all speculation. But well, there's no helping it. If he can't do it, then who can? He says to make sure he doesn't give away anything to the press. If he can't find Enya by tonight, submit a missing person report. He walks away and says put more people from the Special Affairs Division into the Zippel territory. Make sure they are careful, although they are on friendly terms. He says the fact that he's not very patient, and he thinks Raz knows why that very well. Raz replies he will fulfill his expectations. His Majesty, the Emperor. After a while, two people sit in a room, and Viscal briefs Bubare on the situation, mentioning that Andre used the Devil Stone. He says in place of the island there is a vortex, so he's certain that a Devil Stone broke. Bubari interrupts, asking how they dare destroy his product like that, and he tells them not to use it so carelessly until it is complete. He chews food and throws food at Viscal's face. He says he can't forgive them and suggests they go and argue with them right now, as those foolish mages don't know the value of that product. Viscal covers his face from food particles and thinks those stupid Zippel idiots made a mess of things, and thanks to them, he'll have to postpone killing this pig. Bubari says he knew it. Viscal's angry too, and he felt a murderous intent just now. Viscal says that because of this, the leader is extremely angry and wants to reconsider the alliance with the Zippel family. So for now, ignore communications with them. A mysterious person uses a magical ball and acknowledges that Andre is dead. Kahuni the dragon says he had left with Villetta and he even took the devil's stone. The mysterious woman says it must have been one of them. It's either that the silver dragon's power was beyond their expectations or someone else got involved. Kajune replies, who could it be? The shadow dragon was the one that killed the graveyard giant in Kinzalo. Misha, if it was her strength, then it makes sense. And she wouldn't be scared of the devil stone. They are talking about Misha, Murakan's sister, as they are not aware that Murakan has been released from his prison yet. Kajune says, that's right. On top of that, Quickentel is Murakan's ex-lover. She is not a complete stranger to Misha. They must have teamed up to stop our plans. The mysterious woman says, then they know what he needs to do next. Kayune asks if she wants her to go and find Misha, and says that's impossible. If the black dragons want to hide, no one can find them. She laughs and says to stop being a baby. Anyway, it's a shame that they lost the Devil Stone. Kajun asks how is she this calm with her younger brother Ho Chu death. Of course, she's sad. However, she knew this would happen, and she was so shocked to hear that he visited Chiron's banquet recently without telling her. Kajune says she's lying and laughs. Kajune will tell the maker of the Devil Stone to make it again. If they don't have that object, 
They can't take over the Runcandle family before Chiron dies. And it's the same for the Black Sea Kings. The mysterious woman says she doesn't think he's the only one who is annoyed by this, referring to having to talk with Bubari. Kajune replies she should also stop being a baby and that she be the one who talks to him. If she wants to take over the world, she needs to do all TS that much. After a while, Jin knocks on the gate of Jilly's house. Jilly opens the door and asks who is there. Jin replies that they are back and asks if Jilly can prepare them a meal. He says they couldn't eat anything while they were flying back and mentions that Lady Luna is also here. Jilly fainted. Murakan yelled, calling her strawberry pie. Murakan uses a hand fan to cool Jilly while she says the young master is being expelled. Lady Luna says it seems like his nanny is misunderstanding the situation, but that means she worries a lot about him. He has a good nanny. Jin says she's too good for him. Kashmir arrives there and says he's back. But who are these people? He says it's a little sudden, but this is his eldest sister, Luna Runkhandel. She says hello to Kashmir, the noble sword, whom she has heard so much about. Kashmir says it's embarrassing to call him the noble sword, and it's an honor for him to be able to serve her. The other person is Enya's guardian dragon, the silver dragon, quick and tell. Kashmir thinks that he can annoy another dragon and greets her. He says he's Kashmir, the head of the seven colors and young master Jin's acquaintance. He thinks he can't make a mistake like last time. Meanwhile, Jin apologizes, acknowledging that he did something discourteous without informing him in advance. He responds that it's all right and that they are already in the same boat. Quick and tell inquires about Enya's whereabouts and Kashmir says he was just about to mention it. Three hours ago, Latri returned. Jin asks if it happened today, and Kashmir confirms that Latri is currently with his daughter and Enya. However, there's something unusual. Latri doesn't have any memories of the time she was missing. Latri was asked if she was kidnapped, to which she denies, and Latri insists she knows for certain, mentioning Valetta's statement about teaching her dragon language magic and forgetting what happened after that. Kashmir thinks Latri might not have been kidnapped by the Zipples after all, to which Quikintel answers that this is incorrect, as Andre and Valletta both gloated about it. Murakan responds that they are erasing the evidence. Jin inquires about what he means by evidence, and he explains that they are likely erasing everything related to the Devil Stone, including Latra's memories. He mentions that erasing everything is the Zippel family's specialty when things don't go their way. Kashmir asks about the Devil Stone, and Jin explains that it's an artifact in their possession. Jin explains what happened with the Zippel family's vice head, the Wind Dragon, and the Devil Stone adding that it's an artifact that absorbs contractors of the Lords. He reflects on the lengths they've gone to and questions their motives behind the Devil Stone. He concludes that there's only one reason why they would create an imitation of an origin stone. They want to become Lords. He explains that they are attempting to gather all the power of the existing Lords and eliminate all those who oppose them, aiming to become the sole Lord controlling this world. Kashmir suggests resting for now and promises to investigate the matter thoroughly with the Seven Colors if she agrees, and he will accompany her to where Enya is. She agrees and states that she will go. He responds all right this way. Jilly calls out to Jin. He asks if she is feeling better. Jilly confirms, but as soon as she sees Luna standing there, she faints again, prompting Murakin to scream strawberry pie again. Later on, Luna sits down and holds a wine bottle. She mentions that after Jin destroyed the notorious underground gangs Tessin and Tykin, the independent city became more secure. She notes that the Zippel family's vice head and Valletta were also killed, and he achieved all of this within two months of becoming a reserve flag bearer. She mentions that he even used magic without official acknowledgement, which could have resulted in his death if caught, and she finds it an incredible feat. Jilly admits that she thought everything was over when she caught them, but she now realizes that she already knows everything. She laughs, reassuring her that she can overlook it once. Jilly says as long as they avoid the Patriarch, they will be safe. She explains that their father already knows about everything, from the testing incident to Andre Zippel's death, and soon he will also know about her involvement. Jilly expresses concern, stating that it could be really bad, and then Jin arrives, saying not to worry, as he has a plan. He explains that he plans to meet their father together with his eldest sister. Luna asks if he had a plan all along, and he confirms that he did intending to meet their father now, and they both become shocked while Jilly says it not wise to meet his father now while he is turning a blind eye to the whole situation. Jin says that he must inform his father that the Zippel family is planning to attack the Run Candles. Luna asks Jin if he knows what happens to reserve flag bearers that return home before the end of the exam. Jin says he will make a deal with his father to overlook all of this in exchange for the information Jin has. Luna says in all her years, she has never seen anyone test her father patience like he does, 
and warns him, if he keeps this up, father will kill him. He mentions that when that time comes, he trusts that she'll stop him, noting that even her family is intimidated by her. Luna said that Jin really has a natural ability to make enemies out of everyone, showing how hard it must have been for Jilly because of him, but she agrees to go with him and asks when they are departing. He plans on using the first teleportation gate tomorrow. She responds that it's best to move as quickly as possible. While Jilly tries to say something, Luna interrupts her, saying since their family consists of people who are busy fighting each other. She should at least be a caring family member to Jin, so she will become his shield. She expresses confidence that Jin would have thought of a plan to not get them both killed. He affirms this, saying, of course. After a while, they arrive at the Garden of Swords. Runtia arrives and comments on how she brought him with her instead of persuading him. Luna says that Jin came here on his own. Runtia questions if she expects her to believe that Luna can stop Jin. Irritated, Luna looks to Jin, saying she should beat him up for putting her in this family feud that she hates. Jin sarcastically says she promised to treat her younger brother well. Vigo Runcandle remarks about his crazy behavior and questions if he cares about anything, wondering why he returned and daringly seeks the Garden of Swords before finching the flag bearer exam. Mayu attributes this situation to their eldest sister being lenient while Anne Runcandle accuses him of neglecting the responsibility of being a reserve flag bearer, asserting that she knows Luna also thinks this is excessive. Luna reflects on how everyone seems prepared for this situation, wondering if their father knew. Mary Runcandle expresses shock, asking if the youngest gave up his right to be a flag bearer, or maybe he has a death wish, but she insists he can't do that yet as he still needs to have a fight with her when he grows up. Meanwhile, Runtia asks her sister why she brought him there and Luna says she didn't. He came on his own. Runtia replies that she should have stopped him and not been thoughtless just because he is. Luna just says whatever and asks about their father's whereabouts, prompting Runtia to question why she's asking about him. Jin thought that for some reason, Luna always found a hard time dealing with Runtia. Runtia asks if Jin came there to meet with their father. He confirms this, addressing her as the second eldest sister, while Vigo laughs and remarks that he really wants to die stating that he only survived due to luck and questioning if he thought highly of himself just because he was slightly better than the Tona twins. Runtia takes out her sword and holds it to Luna's neck, blocking her way. She declares that from that moment on, the first flag bearer is to discard her weapon. Stating that this is a strict order from the Patriarch, she reminds the reserve flag bearer that their father asked for him to come alone. Luna threatens them, asking what if she doesn't drop her weapon. All the siblings surround Luna, Runtia emphasizes that this is her last chance, citing it as an order from the Patriarch, so she must discard her weapon. She warns that resistance will result in her being killed. Jin assures his eldest sister not to worry as they all prepare for a confrontation. She then looks back at him. Jin says he isn't here as a member of the Runcandle family, but as a son meeting his father, mentioning that he has come to tell him something and assures her that nothing bad will happen. They all stand in shock as he enters the castle. Jin reflects on how his other siblings don't know their father very well, acknowledging that although it's against the rules for a reserve flag bearer to come home, he doesn't think their father cares about the rules. He believes that if he gives him a chance to explain like he did last time, recalling the Tona twins incident, Jin believes there won't be any problem as he reaches the study room door and knocks. Upon entering, the door was blown away. His father remarks that it seems his expectations are too high, reminding him that he had given him five years and questioning why he has returned so soon. Jin recalls hearing about how his father's sword energy completely obliterates his enemies. He notes that his father also wields a sword made from aura and might be intentionally demonstrating what will happen if he uses his sword, realizing that his father is more powerful than he had thought. His father asserts that he won't ask him twice and inquires about the reason for his son's visit. Jin reflects that he can't apologize, even if it costs him his life, feeling the need to be confident um, but not arrogant. He states that he came because he missed him. His father ponders about never hearing such sentiments from his children before and considers it not to be a bad thing. His father remarks on how immature Jin has become, questioning if he softened after experiencing the outside world. Jin responds that it's not due to exposure to the outside world, but rather because he has always liked him. A huge aura engulfs the room. Jin wonders if he has misspoken, feeling the murderous intent of his father. But the reality is his father almost laughed and wanted to cover it up. Chiron tells him to stop talking nonsense and get to the point. He asks what Jin has brought. Jin explains that Andre Zippel, 
the vice head of the Zippel family, has died. His father asks if Jin killed him, to which he replies that it was Luna, but he created the situation. Jin then asks if he can report the events that transpired, adding that he wants to discuss a few more things if it's acceptable to his father. His father agrees and invites him to take a seat as he descends the stairs. 